Evening, everyone. I'd like to call the special meeting of the Temple City City Council to order. Madam Clerk, can we have the roll call, please? Yes, Mayor. Council Member Chavez? Here. Council Member Sternquist is absent. Council Member Yu? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Fish? Here. Mayor Yu? Excuse me. Man. Here. Mayor Mann? Here. <laughs> uh, Freudian slip. I'd like, like to excuse uh, <laughs> Council Member Sternquist for cause. Second. Okay, so if there are no objections, Council Member Sternquist is excused. Uh, we will move on to a public comment for the closed session items. Um, I do have a number of uh, comment cards here. I just want to remind everyone, uh, it's also written on the agenda, that uh, each one of you uh, are allowed it three minutes to address the City Council up here at the podium. And in the interest of time, um, we are going to try to limit this period of public comment to 30 minutes. And gauging based on the number of request forms, I think we will be within that 30 minute mark. So if you could please keep your comments within three minutes, uh, that would be much, much appreciated. Hello. Can I ask who never is parked alongside this wall in the council parking, if you could please move your car? <laughs> Yeah, so. Or you'll get the, a ticket. Yeah, yeah, yeah otherwise you're going to so take it. So if you yeah. can move your car, it would be appreciated. I'm parked in a no parking. So if you're alongside this wall right here, <laughs> yeah, you okay. can move your car. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, facing this wall. Facing this wall, if you're parked, you're going to get a ticket. So if you could please move your car. Okay. I think it's the floor runner. Is it it's a, a forerunner? Is it the white one? White, white forerunner. Right for okay. okay. All right. We haven't done that in a while. Okay. I'll, it's, just, it's just public comments. Right? Okay. All right. So the uh, the first. Hold on. Let me just make sure I got get everyone here. All right. So the first person I I like to call up is uh, Wendy Poon. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Good evening. My name is Wendy. I live in Temple City. Yeah. My name is Wendy. I live in Temple Thank City. Thanks for the opportunity to express my concerns on the, um, the cannabis facility in El Monte. First, I want to clarify that I'm not against marijuana. It's uh, legalized, after all, in California. But I'm strongly against building a project near such a densely populated residential areas. And the following are the reasons. Number one, once it gets the green light, the floodgate will open. Another similar proposal on Goodley in Amonte is already scheduled for a public hearing by the end of this month. According to some reports, eight more apl applications are waiting to rush in. Number two, even though this project is in the city of Amonte, it's just across the street from the residential areas in Temple City. And the project is closer to Temple City than a large part of Amonte. In terms of environmental issues like noise, air pollution, soil pollution, public safety, increased <coughs> traffic, as well as precious water and electricity usage, Temple City will have the most negative impact. Number three, the project lets the city of El Monte keep a large amount of revenue from fees and sales in the city coffer. Meanwhile, making residents of Temple City and the surrounding cities suffer economically and environmentally. It's the unfairness that caused the opposition in the surrounding cities. Number four, Within one mile radius, there are 10, more than 10, schools and youth centers. As a parent myself, I'm concerned about the safety and the negative influence on children. Number five, Temple City residents don't have the electoral influence in El Monte, but we do in, the, in Temple City. We rely on our elected officials to do the right thing to protect residents to help maintain the quality of life in our peaceful and close-knit city. For many years, we have appreciated the city leadership 
in keeping our community safe and sound. And this time, we hope that you will stand with us to fight. Number six, San Gabriel Valley enjoys our perfect geographical location and the fine quality of life. We all want to continue for ourselves the well-being and the well-being of our next generations. But this project and the others waiting for approval can begin to destroy our communities, including Amante. I strongly urge the city council to vote for litigation against the cannabis project in Amante. Finally, I would like to ask the audience, if you agree with me, please raise no, your no, hands. No, 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 excuse me, you can't. <laughs> uh, you can't do that. Okay. Yeah, so, we need to stop that. Yeah, okay. All right, so I, again, for those of you who have been here before, I do ask you to direct your comments to the city council. And as emotional as it does get, please do refrain from disrupting others while they speak. Um, Mr. Mayor? Yeah. Uh, if I might, and if it's at, at the pleasure of the council, uh, obviously the, the people are um, emotionally involved in this. But as you know, uh, clapping and cheering can slow down the meeting. What I've seen done in other cities is if people agree with what's being said, instead of clapping or yelling, just raise your hands. Good idea. The, the council will see that your hands are raised and you agree, but the mayor can then call the next person and we can move more quickly. Okay. So if it's the council's pleasure and if the people Excellent. will do that, we would appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Is so it one hand or two? <laughs> <laughs> either either, either way is fine. Okay. All right, so, so please, um, if you raise your hands, we, we will see you very clearly from, from here. Uh, next, I'd like to call uh, Ms. Feng Liu. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. I'm still writing my notes. Uh, uh, thank you so much. We really appreciate all the city councils, city attorney, and the city clerk. Thank you so much for being, standing for us, with us at such difficult time. Thank you again. Uh, first thing I want to say is still, I always say, please file a lawsuit as soon as possible. We have very good case. Here I have evidence this is 640 pages to prove all the land, they are seriously contaminated. I will submit this to the, to the records for today. Please file a lawsuit. The second thing I want to say is please, so, you know, you, you guys city councils have meetings with all kinds of politics where you meet those senators, legislators, please give them some advice. Start a new law, new bill, new proposition. Okay, sorry. <laughs> because I was trying to catch time. Uh, she only what has you, three minutes, so she's. I uh, know, but I want to hear what. Okay. <laughs> because uh, as city council, you have meetings. You know, you meet the senate, you meet the legislature. When you talk to them, please tell them we sh we need a new law, new new audience, new pr proposition. Why? When one city put such huge project have has such big impact, environment big Im impact to the whole community, including neighbor cities. They should give neighbor cities, and they should give resident even if from neighbor cities sufficient notice. We need a new law, new rule for that. Because the amount of city right now, they said, oh, you don't live, my house is very close to the project. I didn't receive any notice. They said, oh, you're not living our amount. By law, we don't need to give you the notice. That's unfair. We need a new law, please. City councils, I think you guys have this access. You know, you have to go to meetings, meet those uh, senators, ask them, start a new bill, new law for people. So, <laughs> thank you. And the fourth thing I want to say is, uh, please file the lawsuit. You know, we have so many great people, Temple City people, they're great. They are very supportive, they are very generous. I have very good experience. If you start lawsuit, anything need help. Temple City people, people from St. Gabriel, they are very supportive. They will support us, they will support us. Temple 
Temple City. There was support Temple City Council, support Temple City Attorney. Need a, you, if need a legal fee, we can we can raise the fund. We we have so many generous people. If need anybody vote, we have so many people. They come out to vote for us. Please, you have us. We are here for you know for the city. Not only city city attorneys are fighting. Not only city councils are fighting. All people in Temple City are fighting with you. Please file the lawsuit. We can win the case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, wait. Right. Mm -hmm. Hands, please, 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 hands. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Next, I'd like to call up. Uh, is it Jung Ho? Yes. Jung Ho. Honorable City Council and Mayor and City staff, fellow residents, I want to point out a few concerns regarding the proposed marijuana plants in El Monte and I urge the city leaders to take actions on behalf of the citizens of the Temple City. Uh, first item is ventilation. Uh, marijuana plants need fresh air to grow. That means cool air, fresh, fresh, fresh air in, stale air, hot air out. Uh, the grow need uh, ventilation in order to, for indoor buildings in order to grow marijuana. Uh, that means they're going to need large exhaust fans in the building. Uh, with the size of 72,000 square feet in the Almonte site, it's going to require a lot of building, a lot of ventilation. That means a lot of uh, noise for the local residents. Uh, second item is smell. Cannabis crops take uh, about three months to produce. Uh, during the final four weeks, uh, the plant stinks. <laughs> and uh, if you ever go buy a plant or use any plant, the marijuana plant, you're gonna smell it. The pungent smell is strong, and with the size of that building, the amount of uh, plants they're gonna have, you're gonna have a lot of strong smell out of the building. So the air quality of the local area is gonna be affected greatly. Uh, and then uh, alongside with the ventilation, it's gonna pump out a lot of uh, the smell into the local area. Uh, the third item is safety. The proposed site in Monty will be a cultivation plant as well as a sales site. That means it's going to attract a lot of elements into the area. Uh, I work closely with a couple of growing sites in LA. The sites have armed security guards, and you know the reason why they have armed security guards. Uh, with the sales site, you're going to attract a lot of un unwanted uh, elements in the area, and also. Uh, you have criminals that try to make a quick buck off somebody, and put, there's potential for criminal acti activities in the area. Uh, these all pose safety problems for the residents in the surrounding area. Uh, the fourth item is power consumption. In, uh, in an article I read in Boulder County, Colorado, during the second quarter in, in 2015, a 5,000 square feet indoor cannabis facility was using 29 kilowatt hours per month uh, in el electricity. That's roughly 5.8 kilowatt per square foot. So looking at the size of that building at, uh, at, in El Monte, you're looking at 417,000 kilowatt hour per month. A regular household use about 500 kilowatt hours per month. So that means you have a lot of increased power consumption in this area. In increased co consumption means uh, the power generator has to generate more power invest in power generation. That means increased cost for everyone, as well as the envir environmental impact for everyone. So our city leaders and residents have worked hard to make Sem Temple City one of the most desirable communities in San Gabriel Valley. And I've li lived here for 18 years, and I enjoyed every bit of it, and I wish it stays that, wish it stays that way. So we now look to and urge our city leaders to take all actions necessary to protect the, city, the interests of the city and the residents. And I want to thank the city council for authorizing the city attorney to work on this matter already from looking at the previous videos. Thank you. All right, cool. All right, well. All right for, thank you. Thank you, please. Yes, for those who uh, just got in, please uh, just raise your hand. Thank you. All right, next uh, I'd like to call up Jody Yu. Can we have them 
say if they're residents or okay. not. It would just help okay. me. <laughs> sure. And if, if you could please uh, mention if you're a resident of Temple City. I'm also. a resident of San Gabriel. San Gabriel? Thank yes. okay. okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your time. Um, uh, we all know, or, or at least we've all heard, about the medis uh, medicinal benefits of marijuana. That's why we have dispensaries where people with valid prescriptions can go and get their drug of choice um, to help alleviate their whatever's, you know, um, they're suffering from. Similarly, we also have liquor stores where people, amongst other things, can go and purchase their alcohol or wine or beverage of choice. What we don't have is a large-scale alcoholic brewery in our residential neighborhood. Unfortunately, the wisdom and the wise residents of El Monte, they have approved a large-scale marijuana growing factory in a residential neighborhood. Now granted, this location, 4400 Temple City Boulevard, is in the city of El Monte. However, directly across the street are homes located in Temple City, are residents of Temple City. The streets, the shared streets, are driven by people not only that live in Temple City, El Monte, but San Gabriel Valley as a whole. I can go on and read this prepared statement, but it's all going to be the same things that you've heard, and it's all the same things that you kind of know. Uh, opening this facility, it's going to open the floodgates, maybe more than one, up to ten, up, you know, they'll open up more of these types of facilities. As a result, traffic will suffer. Air quality has a potential to get worse. Crime rates will go up. Maybe homelessness and the people, you know, the kind of people that want to hang around in these kind of facilities, amongst other things. Um, crime rates is going to go up because of cash, cash business. Lastly, property values are going to suffer. It's going to take a hit. These people that are um, opening up this location, they're very smart. They don't live in El Monte. They put in a clause that says, oh, we're going to hire like 45 people, and at least 10% are going to be residents of El Monte. That's like 4.5. That's like five people. That's like five security guards. Those people don't live here. They, why don't they live here? They don't want to live in a place where they're right next to a mar marijuana growing facility. They're probably living Pasadena, somewhere far, wherever. you know. So as a result, more of these come up. Nobody wants to live here. And not only will the city of the, the whole San Gabriel Valley will suffer, but the city of El Monte, you'll suffer the most because you're right next door. You're the first line of defense. So we got to nip this in the bud. We got to stop this right now while we can. Um, in this prepared statement, they said that they believe that an EIR was required, but El Monte only issued a mitigative negative declaration. This does not address the many problems and concerns other cities um, apparently have and failure to act will encourage future developers to bypass the requirements of CEQA. So thank you for your time, and um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. All right, next I'd like to call up um, Hubert King. Hubert King. Uh, Hubert King from uh, Temple City. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, thank you for the opportunity to let me speak today. Uh, uh, as I recall, the Amontes uh, mayor already admitted <coughs> to the public hearing the project will impact the children negatively. Mr. King, can you lower the microphone so we can hear you a little better? Yeah, kind of speak into the microphone so we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, is it okay? Yeah, yeah thank you. Better, thank okay, good. Uh, one of the negative uh, one of the mitigated measures would be using part of the income generated uh, to fund the project uh, to, uh, uh, f of the uh, Amonti education. However, uh, there's no uh, program uh, in Temple City to make use of that fund. The project is closer to our city than in Amonti residents. Uh, but we have uh, uh, a lot of residents near the project. While the Temple City residents do not have much influence on other cities, the residents of Temple City 
uh, relying on you, councilman, to do the job uh, to uh, uh, try to keep our city uh, drug-free and uh, in a safe uh, environment. Uh, while amid all this negativity, I do see one bright uh, spot uh, that I can, I'm seeing a lot of voters, a lot of residents in this city uh, before it's not uh, non-voters, they're trying to unite together mm -hmm. to uh, participate voting uh, next year. So I hope you can uh, uh, do your best to help us uh, so that we can vote you again. Thank you. I'm sorry, so we can, you can do what? So vote for you again. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Don't you want Thank to you. vote? Thank you. <laughs> No, no, I didn't understand what you said. I'm Thank sorry. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. King. Uh, next, um, Ms. Cindy Lee. Hi, Mr. Mayor and uh, council members. Um, actually, I'm new in Temple City residence. Um, for many years, both past and present, elected and appointed officials have worked to make Temple City one of the most desirable communities in the San Gabriel Valley, whether it will be providing outstanding schools or city safe for families. Policies have been enacted to share positive values with all members of the community. Thriving business and safe neighborhoods are the result of this hard work and property values have increased as more people and businesses wish to be part of our beautiful city. That's why I'm here. Now we are threatened by the adjacent city, El Monte, who um, whose elected officials have chosen ma uh, money over values. Constructions of the huge marijuana facilities at 4400 Temple City Boulevard and the additional seven or eight facilities um, to, to follow soon in the same area will greatly impact the environment in Temple City. This will cause property value to drop and will discourage new business from locating in Temple City. Many residents will decide to move to areas of Southern California without the problems the proposed facilities bring. This will reduce the asset value, property tax revenue, and sales tax revenue, making it more difficult for Temple City to maintain its high value and service to its citizens. Our city council has the authority and respond a responsibility to step up and do everything it can to stop this and similar projects until a proper environmental impact report is prepared addressing the cumulative effect of so many large marijuana facilities in the same area. Our city attorney has identified the shortcomings of Almonte's handling of the project and send details concerns to Almonte. Almonte not only rejected all of Temple City's concerns, but ignored Temple City's response to Almonte's written dismissal. Please give the full authorization to the city attorney to proceed with an environmental lawsuit under the provisions of CEQA. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Lee. All right, next, uh, I'd like to call Betty Wren. What's her last name? Wren, R-E-N. City Council members, good evening. good evening. My name is Betty Wren. I'm a businesswoman in Temple City for many years. The cannabis business to be opened in uh, El Monte concerns me a lot. 2020 election is around the corner. I believe more residents will come out and vote this time. With El Monte City Council being a bad example, 
we now understand how important our world is, how we world determines what type of city we will be living or working in. Is that family and business friendly with positive core values like ours, or the one with our, with our societies, with our society? Money driving government with no consideration of the sustainability of our community. We truly believe each and every one of our city council members will look after their constituents and deserves our respect, trust, and votes. Tonight, I urge you to do the right thing to support our city attorney's work. Let him continue his work to fail the environmental lawsuit against El Monte and let the polluted cannabis facilities stay far away from our homes, which shall never be so close to our residential you know, area from the start. Furthermore, the negative impacts will be continuously with us for now and forever. Please do the city and the residents a favor. Provide a safe environment for us to raise our children by trying to stop the commercial uh, uh, cannabis project in El Monte. We understand there's no guarantee in any legal action, but the residents appreciate you decision or trying to stop the project, or else city of El Monte will be the known capital of Mahana, Marihana in Southern California with more proposal to come. Needless to say, it will create profound negative impacts on Temple City's social and economically. It will directly ruin the beautiful city's reputations and changing away investors in business and the real estate, and then income residents after countless years of hard work built up by the current and the past councils. In 2020, we wish to see all of you continue to lead our city with tonight's, tonight's good judgment and the decision as a departure to a successful fight against pollution and the corruption. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Betty Run. And uh, lastly, I'd like to call up, uh, is it Chang Bjorn Bach? Yes. Okay. So f for those of you writing it down, it's Q-I-A-N-G. Last name B A K. B A K. Yeah. Well, good. Time starts. Okay. Good evening, uh, Mayor and the City Councilman. Good and I'm a resident of Rosemi. I'm here because I want to address two issues. Uh, of course, the marijuana plantation, uh, uh, the uh, cultivation center, and uh, in El Monte. I believe this word called location, location, location. We heard that all the time when, the, when it comes to real estate. So um, the problem of this project is that it, it is too close to the residential area, as, as the other speakers have pointed out, and it's too close to the schools. And also we worry about it, it, it is going to be a starting point of a floodgate that the, uh, you know, this project will encourage the other people to invest in a multi open up more projects in residential area. And although this project is in our Mountain, but it really, it's so close to Rosemi, and it's so close to Temple City. So um, I do encourage the city to um, consider about the litigation against the El Monte City or the property owner. Um, second issue I want to address is the cost effective. I mean, I'm handling, I'm a lawyer, and I've been practicing for 16 years. And all I consider is about the cost and effect, right? Is this it cost, cost and the benefit? Is it worthwhile to 
dri you know, derive the, uh, the tax revenue from the cultivation of marijuana. And somebody did the study, um, according to their study, they're saying that for each one dollar uh, tax revenue from marijuana, the cost of a society, the whole social cost is about $4.5. Really, we are $3.5 in negative. So I, I just hope not only the... Um, the uh, Where's that study from? Um, I believe somebody provided uh, from the, uh, the Colorado State. And I, I need to follow up with the person and they are doing the, the, the study and the research. So um, I have his business cards. I will give him a call and ask him to send me the documents. But it will be, it's, it will be my pleasure to forward it to the uh, Temple City Councilman and the mayor as well. And so, you know, for your reference. And I, I believe it's important for the cities to, you know, generate revenue to cover the cost and provide a better service for the residents. The problem is that if we're too short-sighted, if we are, if we started on the wrong route, it's been, the whole society will pay for it. Well, that's probably all I can say. I didn't read from my script. I sort of kind of <laughs> just talk, you know. Um, and uh, well, thank you for listening. Um, have a good day. Okay. Have Park, a good night. Ms. Park, just a real quick question. Yes. Uh, since you mentioned you're a resident of Rosemead, have you also presented this same argument to the Rosemead City Council? I didn't. I, well, I should do that. To? I'm going to actually. I, I actually, I'd invite the, one of the council member to my house, and two or three days later, I will talk with her in detail. Perfect. Yes. Thank that you. Would be great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. You're great. welcome. Thank you. And so, um, at this point, I think we've. I think there's one last gentleman. If you, sir, if I, I see you reaching for a speaker request form, why don't you just maybe just come up here? And just fill uh, it out after. yeah, fill it out after. And, and just so you know, um, for those of you who had just arrived, we did. I did mention at the beginning that because of time constraints, we are going to limit this session to uh, 30 minutes. So, Sorry. sir, I think you will be the last person to speak uh, All right. during this period of public comment. If you still wish to address the council, we will reconvene as part of our regular meeting. It says 7.30, but at the rate we're going, it's probably going to be later than that. There's going to be a period for public comment at that time as well. So I would ask those of you who have ha not had a chance to speak to perhaps wait till that, that period. Thank you, sir. So good evening, uh, City of Temple City, good evening, uh, good evening. City Council Member staff, and those who are watching, and the residents. Uh, Gabriel Ramirez, I am not a resident of Temple City. I'm a resident of El Monte. I do want to uh, really um, give a thanks to the two... Uh, one city council member and the mayor of Temple City for coming to the city of Almani on December 18th to speaking against the project uh, of, the, of the manufacturer of uh, cultivated cannabis uh, warehouse that is going to be uh, being built. Uh, I do uh, 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 commend you and I applaud you for that. And it's really disgusting when, we, when, when the, our mayor, the mayor of, of Almani uh, challenged the city of Temple City and the Rosemead sheriffs, uh, according to him, when I was watching the video, and, and I, there's some summarizing, he's, he, he, pound his, he said he pounded uh, to his chest, uh, pretty much saying that, that uh, Armani, ha Armani police has the, uh, the, uh, the best law enforcement uh, officers. Uh, he pretty much, com uh, pretty much spoke against the Temple City sheriff, I mean, the sheriffs of uh, Temple Station, and, and that, um, that the chief of police spoke to the captain of the of the temple uh, stations of uh, stating that that I'm assuming from my understanding that that the temple uh, sheriff station uh, agreed to whatever it was that I'm trying to be, uh, better understanding and hopefully if you guys can really uh, talk to your captain about if it's, this is true or not because it's been going different ways of I don't know which whose facts are are, are stating the truth so I just want to say that uh, it's really I, I apologize for my city that is really becoming a bad neighbor to here and to Rosemead and to the surrounding cities. It really is saddening and I, I just, I'm just here to make sure that our surrounding cities that we become a good neighbors. But unfortunately with this council that we have, unfortunately they're breaking the, the relationship. And, and I just wanna say that um, please, you know, uh, don't count against the residents because I'm, as a resident, I just wanna make sure that we have a, a relationship with Temple City and our surrounding cities. And, 
and uh, thank you for your time and I apologize for at the last minute so thank you uh, thank you all right and so I uh, thank thank you everyone uh, we've reached the end of uh, public comment for this period the council is now going to recess in closed session for the two items listed below and we will supposedly reconvene at 7 30 but we'll play by ear thank you All right, good evening, everyone. Category for some the City Council has uh, reconvened from closed session, and I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Greg Murphy, our City Attorney, to please report out. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. With respect to item A, the employee performance evaluation, that was put over to a future meeting. With respect to item B, the anticipated litigation, uh, I first want to say, uh, as I've been directed to say by the City Council uh, to the public, that going back to um, last month, um, and in fact before that when this was discussed, but in particular last month on December 18th when the mayor and council member you appeared at El Monte on behalf of the city, they were appearing at unanimous direction of the city council. Uh, that is to say that all five members of the city council were in agreement um, and agreed on what should be said that night. Uh, but it was recognized by the city council that the city of Temple City's meeting nights are the same as those for the city of El Monte, and that the city of Temple City needed to have its business done as well. So three members of the council volunteered to stay home and be here that night and do the city of Temple City's business, while two did special business for Temple City and went to El Monte that night. Uh, all five have been acting together all along, and they acted together tonight when they gave me unanimous direction uh, to file uh, on behalf of your city a lawsuit against the city of El Monte. Uh, please, uh, please, let, please let Mr. Murphy finish his statement. Thank you. A lawsuit. Hold your arms up. <laughs> a lawsuit against the city of, of El Monte uh, with respect to the uh, cannabis uh, cultivation and processing facility based on the violations of the California Environmental Quality Act as recounted in letters sent by the city of Temple City and in other evidence that is available on the record. Uh, the filing of that lawsuit will happen within a week. Uh, as we have said at previous meetings, uh, there have been um, many statements by members of the public with respect to this project. Uh, many of them are uh, matters that cannot be carried forward by the city, even though we are filing a lawsuit based on the California Environmental Quality Act. We encourage any citizen, any resident, any person who believes that they have been wronged in a way that the city cannot move forward with to contact a lawyer on your own and find out whether you also might have a lawsuit that can be brought on your own. Uh, that is your right. Uh, I'm not saying that lawsuits must be filed. I'm just saying that you have individual rights. The city is, in this case, um, moving forward with uh, California Environmental Quality Act violations because those are matters that the city can proceed with. Uh, so that is, again, as I've said, unanimous direction by the city council, and I thank you all for your direction tonight. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And so uh, that concludes our thank And thank you all for coming for your public comments and for staying with us. Um, but that concludes our closed uh, session. So we will now adjourn from closed session and we will move right into our regular meeting. So uh, Madam Clerk, can we, may we have the roll call for the regular city council meeting, please? Yes, Mayor. Council Member Chavez? Here. Council Member Sternquist? Here. Council Member Yu? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Fish? Here. Mayor Mann? Here. And so tonight for the invocation, we are pleased to have Reverend Eli El Bayadi from the Temple Sheriff Station Chapel who will be providing us with the invocation. Uh, please all rise for the invocation and please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much because you taught us how to pray, how to pray for our city, how we pray 
for those who are in charge for the government. We thank you, Lord, for our city. We thank you for the mayor. We thank you, Lord, for every department, the sheriff department. We thank you, Lord, for the fire department. We, fi we thank you for the other departments, departments, Lord. For your precious mighty name, put your hands upon us and bless us, Lord. And we want you, Lord, to bless America through us, because of us, and because of you are blessing us, Lord. And thank you for the decision our city took against this issue. Lord, we love you so much, and we are in the rightness, Lord, to be in the right way, the, right, the way you like it, Lord, for our city and for our country to take against any other demonic decisions. Amen. In Jesus' name, Lord, Amen. give us all the time the right decisions which pleases your heart. Lord, we thank you for the open churches in our city. We thank you for the Bible we have it. Different countries, Lord, we cannot have the Bibles in the Middle East, but we thank you have the Bibles in our hands. Lord Jesus, bless us. Bless the world because of us. Bless America, Lord. Amen. Give us the wisdom to live for you and to reject anything, Lord, not from your heart. You planned for us to have the peace, security, and the welfare, and everything good, you give it to us. Help us to follow you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless our Amen. city here. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Reverend. I'd like to Thank ask uh, Mr. Brian Cook to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please place the flag. Place your right hand over your heart. Repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. First on our ceremonial matters, we have Cindy Rigney, who is the board president of San Gabriel Valley Humane Society, who will be presenting the pet of the quarter, or pets, I should say. Wow. More than one pet. All Thank right. you so much for working with us on that, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I work in La Cunata, so it's a little tough to get down here. Um, so this is Ocho up here that you see. And you see here. He's uh, about five years old. He just came to the shelter right before the holidays. And he is a wonderful, playful boy. He hasn't been with us long enough for us to know too much about him, but we know he loves walks. He's a cuddle bug. He wants to sit in your lap more than anything else in the world. That is his life. That is his dream. He <laughs> likes to play. He's just a people person. Um, he was an owner surrender because his owner had to go into a convalescent home. Aww. So he's really looking for a good home. He's only five years old. So he would be a great choice. I could not resist, and I apologize to the council. Um, I could not resist bringing Zora with me as well tonight. Zora. She is 13 years old. Who's Zora? Zora? Oh my goodness, Zora. She was brought to Zora. We can't Zora. see him. Oh. Um, she's 13 years old. From a physical examination, she was most likely a breeder dog. We do have breeders mm. in some areas. She's got a sweater on. Away from us. Um, and she was even in heat when she came in. Mm. So we did an immediate surgery to make sure that we didn't have any little ones. Uh, she died on the surgery table. We <gasps> brought her back. Oh. She's seen the face of God. Uh, <laughs> she has a purpose. Okay. Um, and just, I did bring some calendars. Council, yes. you've got your calendars. They're beautiful, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank These you. are available at the Humane Society. And I'd also like to let everybody know about a fundraiser that will be coming up next Sunday, January 20th, at a local oh, yeah. brewery. Oh. Okay? So it. thank you all so very much, and thank you for the little additional time okay. of bringing two dogs. Appreciate thank you. It. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So next, I'd like to, uh, we have a presentation from the Clean Power Alliance. 
Uh, I'd like to call up Ms. Jennifer Ward, who is the head of Local Government Affairs for the Clean Power Alliance. Ms. Ward? Well, thank you. Uh, thank good you. evening, Honorable Mayor, mm -hmm. members of the City Council. I just have to say, I've given a lot of council presentations, but I've never had to follow two puppies, so this is <laughs> the hardest act I've ever had to follow, <laughs> so bear with me. <laughs> um, Again, thank you so much for having me this evening. I'm the head of local government affairs for Clean Power Alliance, which is the new community choice energy provider for residents and businesses here in Temple City, as long with 30 other communities across Los Angeles and Ventura counties. Um, next slide. And really our mission is to empower our communities and customers and give you all a choice about your energy supply which is a choice you previously didn't have with Southern California Edison being the only source of energy for your community. Next slide. Um, Ex this, excuse me one sorry. second. Brian, can we shut the back door? Yeah. I, can't, I can't hear. Thank so um, as I mentioned, we're a community choice energy or community choice aggregation or CCA. And we um, have partnered with the city of Temple City along with those 30 other communities. And that structure gives us the ability to purchase clean and renewable power and provide it to the residents of Temple City um, and ultimately the businesses as well at competitive or a more affordable rates than SCE currently offers. Next slide. We're set up as a joint powers authority or a JPA, which means that we have a lot more um, public access and local control over your energy sources than you previously experienced. And I want to um, recognize Mayor Pro Tem Fish for serving on our board of directors. We really appreciate all of your time, um, as well as the city staff who've been very involved and helpful. Um, I also want to recognize that we just recently established a community advisory committee, which is set up of ratepayers to represent our residents and our customers. Um, and I believe Robert Parkhurst, who's one of our representatives for the San Gabriel Valley, is here this evening um, to listen. So uh, next slide. Um, as you can see, we have 30 other member communities outside of Temple City. Many of your neighbors here in this region are participating in this new energy provider. Uh, but just to highlight for Temple City, nearly 12,000 residential customers, currently Southern California Edison customers, will begin receiving Clean Power Alliance service, or you'll begin receiving your energy supply from Clean Power Alliance starting in February uh, 2019, so starting next month. And I wanted to highlight that there's um, just under 3,000 customers here in Temple City who are currently enrolled in the CARE program, which offers a 30% bill discount on your energy bill. That's something that's currently out there um, that customers can sign up for. There's some other financial assistance programs that Edison offers, and those financial assistance programs will continue for residents. You don't have to reapply or anything like that. Um, next slide. So just the kind of the nuts and bolts of how it works. Clean Power Alliance, as this um, collaboration of local governments, purchases the energy supply, and we deliver it to you through Southern California's existing lines and wires. You pay for that energy supply on your Edison bill. You remain a Southern California Edison customer. Your account information and all that remains intact. We simply are now the supplier of your energy, which we source from clean and renewable sources um, to deliver those options. So you as a customer now have a choice in an energy supplier that you, again, didn't previously have. And as well as having choices within Clean Power Alliance, you'll see some of the different rate options we offer. Next slide. Um, I, you'll have to, um, I apologize, this slide and the next slide mention the city of Sierra Madre. As you can imagine, with 31 uh, members, I've been giving a lot of presentations this month, so I apologize for the error on my slide. But everything um, in my presentation is accurate and reflective of Temple City. So to give you all a sense of the timing, um, we have been serving a small amount of non-residential customers, but what everyone's interested in right now is the residential service we're rolling out. So again, starting in February next month, um, all residents in Temple City and across our service territory will have that transition to your energy supply coming from Clean Power Alliance, and you'll see that on your Southern California uh, Edison bill. 
Um, and customers have already started to receive notices from Clean Power Alliance in the mail. We've partnered with the city staff and, um, and the council to get the word out through your communication channels, but we're also sending notices in the mail to every resident. You might have not noticed the first one because we're a new organization and um, you know a new brand out there that a lot of people don't notice those first mailers. Um, the mailers are posted on our website and we'll be sending two more notices in the mail in February and March explaining your uh, how this works, explaining your options as a, um, an energy customer. That same process will take place in May 2019 when we'll transition all of the business, the municipal customer accounts, and any industrial accounts as well. Next slide. So when I talk about the options and choices you have as a Clean Power Alliance customer, um, these are the three different rate options we offer. The way community choice aggregation works is you are automatically enrolled as a Clean Power Alliance customer. That's the way the state designed these programs to work. Um, so you'll, in February, you'll start receiving your energy supply from Clean Power Alliance unless you opt out and you want to stay with Southern California Edison as being your supplier. And when that automatic enrollment takes place, you'll be enrolled in our Lean Power product, which is the um, selection, the that the city of Temple City picked as its default, which just means that's the starting point. That's what you automatically get enrolled in. And our Lean Power actually offers a one to 2% savings as compared to what you would pay to Southern California Edison. But as a customer, you can opt up or change your rate option at any time by visiting our website or calling our customer service center. And our other two options, um, so we have Lean Clean and 100% Green. Our clean power is 50% renewable, so more renewable than what you get with Edison at about the same cost. And of course, 100% green power is a seven to nine percent bill increase to what you'd pay to Southern California Edison, but it's nearly three times the amount of renewable energy. Next slide. Um, like I said, you're able to change between these rate options at any time by visiting our website or calling our customer service, and I'll make sure um, that everyone has that information in terms of the number and our website. Our customer service center speaks over 26 languages as well. And they can also help you process what's called an opt out or if you want to, let's say you, you don't wanna um, take advantage of that savings at the lean power rate or you don't wanna participate in Clean Power Alliance as your energy supply, you can simply call us, go to our website and return to SCE. Next slide. Um, I would encourage everyone to visit our website, cleanpoweralliance.org. There's lots of information where you can plug in your existing Southern California Edison information, compare your rates, see how much you might save. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then you can go to the next one as well. And then this is just a sample. We have a sample SCE bill on our website where it shows you um, what portion of your bill will now show charges to Clean Power Alliance. Next slide. Uh, so lastly, I just wanted to leave you with the fact that we're really excited to partner with the City of Temple City and our 30 other member communities to um, offer customers these choices. This is a really easy way because of the way this auto enrollment works. You as a customer don't have to do anything and you'll automatically start seeing um, those new rates on your SEE bill with the savings at the lean power option or it's a really easy way to go online, change your rate option, and have your own personal impact on the environment or air quality if that's something that you wanna do. And then of course, you as the city participating in Clean Power Alliance have a lot more decision-making power and, and local control and public availability to energy sources that we didn't have before. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I'm sure you're starting to get questions from residents and we're more than happy to go out into the community and give community presentations or be at events that you think would be beneficial. Um, like I said, I've been doing this almost every day this month, so we're more than happy to keep it up, and I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. And then if you go to slides, there's my contact information. Um, I don't have a question, but I just have a suggestion. We have actually two big city events coming up. Uh, we've got our Lunar New Year celebration and our Camellia Festival. I'm wondering maybe if it might be beneficial to have a representative at either one or both of these events, uh, mm -hmm. maybe a we can arrange for a table or mm -hmm. some or share a booth mm -hmm. and and provide more information to people who will come because we get a, a lot of people not only from Temple City but the surrounding areas as well. Great. So maybe that's something uh, uh, staff can look at in, in coordinating that mm -hmm. with you. We'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. I also wanted to share that you also have a brand new Facebook. 
We do, yes. We have yes. a new social media. It's another channel. Um, yes. Please follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And we're starting to share information that our jurisdictions are putting out, and so we're happy to do that for Temple City and, and get the word out that we way. We will connect, be connecting our city Facebook with that Facebook. So Great. And then thank you. Chart. So thank you. William? Great. Yes. So every city has a board, um, a member on the board? That's a correct. Participant. All of our 31 current jurisdictions have uh, an elected official who sits on our board of directors. So now that this is starting, will they continue in that same capacity, meeting monthly and voting on different issues? Or how, how does that board of directors operate? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we do have regular monthly meetings of our board, which is where the overall big kind of policy and governance decisions are made. And we also have a series of subcommittees, one focused on energy, one on finance, and one on legislative and regulatory issues, which meet kind of in between our board meetings, not quite on a monthly basis. but. Um, that monthly meeting schedule, I apologize to Mayor Pro Tem, I appreciate you showing up and participating, <laughs> but that monthly schedule is likely going to continue um, for the foreseeable future, That's just right. again, so that as we grow, um, you know, right now we're very focused on rolling out this service to customers, but in the future, CCAs across the state have been able to um, use their, their growth uh, to design programs to benefit the communities. So whether it's investing back into our community through development of renewable energy or designing rate savings programs or rebates and incentives, so our board will start to look at doing those types of things. Is there anything that we can get as council members to help educate ourselves on the issues, like the minutes of the board meetings or um, it, it's just mm -hmm. all so new. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, do, we definitely post all of our agendas and minutes um, on the website. Uh, we also have a lot of other tools on the website that might be more beneficial. So under our customer support tab, we have fact sheets, um, frequently asked questions, that sample bill I mentioned, which might be a little bit easier than looking through board minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we do. We can, and I'm happy to, if you are getting specific questions from your residents or c constituents, we're happy to answer those on a case-by-case -case basis as well. Thank you. Yeah, I do have one question. Now the program is formally rolled out. Are you enrolling or anticipating more cities, more communities, communities joining up? We've had some interest from other uh -huh. jurisdictions who are not part of Clean Power Alliance. Um, uh -huh. We actually just uh, added one member late last year, the city of Westlake Village, which is kind mm -hmm. of on the border of Ventura right. County. So we did um, add them to the mix. Right. And we anticipate some additional interest. Um, if a city joins Clean Power Alliance in 2019, their residents will be able to have service from us in 2020. There's a, um, sorry, 2021. There's a year gap. I see. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming tonight for, and doing this presentation for us. My pleasure, Mayor. Thank you all, thank all you. for having me. Thank you very much. All right, and that concludes our presentations for tonight. Uh, next, we have a public comments on items not listed on the agenda. I do have several speaker request forms. Uh, first, I'd like to call Mr. Steve Terry. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> My name is Steve Terry. I'm here representing the Temple City Sister City Program. I'm here to uh, inform you that uh, Paul Smithers, who is the husband of Bridget Smithers, um, living in Australia, has passed away. He uh, uh, worked, especially the last year, uh, it, he was instrumental in, in driving our students who go to Australia uh, to all of their excursions, as well as driving um, the adults who went this last uh, July, um, June and July, uh, around uh, the Hawkesbury area. Um, Bridget is basically the um, lady that uh, organizes and oversees the uh, student exchange, which uh, we have every uh, July and August, uh, where six of our students go over there. Um, he is survived by Bridget and also his son, Tom, who came across uh, in one of our exchanges, and also his daughter, um, Lauren, who just graduated from high school. 
Um, he passed away uh, due to complications uh, of, um, stemming from surgery, um, uh, basically uh, January 10th. So we just wanted to make you okay. informed of that. Thank you. I just wanted to add, um, I asked the mayor if I could speak on this. We, the city council is going to close our meeting tonight in his honor. Um, I had, if I get a little emotional, I uh, had the honor of staying with him and his family this last summer. Um, he was a very uh, young man, him and his wife. They had a beautiful home, two beautiful children. They opened our, their homes and their hearts to us. They drove us around, they fed us, they were our tour guides. Um, I can't think of a nicer family. Uh, it was very, very sudden. Uh, we are heartbroken. They were true commu community um, volunteers. Um, Bridget had been here several times to the United States to visit. We've all become very good friends with her. Uh, we had all invited their entire families to stay with all of us this next summer because we had got, become such good friends with them. So um, I've also asked that the city council write a letter to Bridget just expressing our condolences again. Um, he was just such a nice man. He, he, what I can remember of him is he, um, he had a very heavy Australian accent. And you know, an Australian accent is English. It's English. <laughs> but I couldn't understand a word he was saying. <laughs> and uh, there were many times, especially if he was speaking to someone else, that I would stop him and say, Paul, what did you just say? Because I swear that was not English. And then he would say it, and I'd say, oh, okay, I get it. But he would just laugh at us because he would say, well, you know, you guys talk funny too. <laughs> and we'd look at each other and say, well, you know, we don't. He was just, he was a wonderful, wonderful man, a wonderful family. And like I said, I, I just, I, I'm speechless. It is just such a shock, such a shock. So, um, um, I wanted to do that before because we, we do have a long meeting tonight and I wanted to make sure that everyone in the audience knows what's going on and that of, of course the sister cities know what's going on and that we appreciate everything. So and just thank in you closing, uh, to coin one of his famous phrases, copy that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you. Right. Thank you, Steve. Uh, next, I'd like to have uh, Captain Flores from our Temple Sheriff Station to uh, provide us with an update tonight. Captain? Good evening, Mayor, Council, staff. Thanks for having me. Um, if you recall, in June of uh, last year, I, I sent an email to uh, the troops at the station. I forwarded that email to you, uh, kind of, I titled it The State of the Station. Mm -hmm. But uh, my personal feeling is, um, you know, we have a contract with you, and that's taxpayer money. So I think it's important you realize where your money's going, and it helps me to be accountable for what goes on at the station. But also, it's important for me to, you, for you to know the uh, scope of the work that is being done as well. And so I'll remind you also that you know Temple Station is one of the largest stations in Los Angeles County. Uh, we have about 240 budget personnel covering five contract cities and covering about 68 square miles of quite a bit of unincorporated area. <clears throat> so in that, uh, I thought. Uh, you know, it would be a good time to cover, again, State of the Station for the entire year of 2018. So in that year, uh, last year, we handled 59,365 calls for service. It's about 2,500 more than the year prior in 2017. Mm. And in Temple City, it was about 7,742 calls for service, service that we handled. We also took 16,685 reports. Uh, it's about 1,462 more reports than the year prior. And in Temple City, uh, part of that number is 2,155 reports. Uh, and as you know, uh, I have really instilled uh, in the deputies uh, the importance of uh, handling quality of life issues, but also uh, we arrest criminals. That's, that's what we do. And so we made 5,003 arrests, which is 1,028 more arrests than in 2017. Excellent. And in Temple City, uh, 558 uh, was the number that we arrested. <clears throat> so in 
So I was very proud of the work that's being done. And as you know, um, we also have something called a risk management forum. And that covers uh, a period of one year at a time. And the numbers that were calculated, we had uh, our forum, it covered from October 2017 through September 2018. So basically October through October up to the last year. And if you recall, also, I also had three goals for the station. The goals were to increase arrests, lower our preventable traffic collisions, and lower our injuries on duty. We met two of those goals. So our overall arrests increased 11%, uh, <clears throat> which is a goal we met. Our narcotics arrest increased almost 26%. And that's the second year in a row that uh, we've had an increase. We also, our public commendations, when the public uh, calls the station to commend a deputy for a job well done, increased almost 31%. And that's the second year in a row that uh, we've had an increase in public commendations. Our personnel complaints, when people call the station to complain about the service that we provided, dropped, decreased over 17%, and that's the second year in a row that is decreased. Um, so our liability uh, funds, you'll, you'll be happy with these numbers. So our automotive liability <laughs> decreased $2,000, but our general liability decreased $57,000. So our preventable traffic collisions uh, remained the same. We didn't increase, um, but I'm still striving to uh, do that. We drove a lot more in 2018 than we did 2017, but I'm still working on that. And also, uh, we had a nearly 13% decrease in our deputies getting injured on the job, which was another goal we had that we did. Um, also, um, although our contacts uh, with the public increased because we had so many more arrests, our uses of force dropped 21%. So I'm really proud of the work that's being done by the deputies. Um, we really appreciate the support of the council and the city and our community. Um, I do believe our best deputies are the ones that embrace the city, care for the community, and really take ownership. So I'm trying to uh, just continue uh, that leadership and instill um, and promote the hard work that's being done. <clears throat> so we look forward to partnering with you uh, this coming year. It's been my honor to be the captain here. Uh, I love the city, I love the station, and I'm really proud of the work that's being done. So that's all I have for you, if you have any questions. Thank you, Captain. Okay. Yeah, Captain, I thanks question. so much. Just, <laughs> <laughs> Everybody <laughs> Sorry, you don't have to If you want to ask questions, that's what I was going to bring up next. And uh, we've mentioned this before. Um, the city council meets with the uh, with our sh uh, our captain and our dedicated uh, deputies the last Wednesday of every month. Uh, it's in next door in our community room. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is it's seven o'clock in the morning those of you who want to get up early but we do provide breakfast as well so any questions or any concerns uh, that would be a good time to come and and listen and we report out of the previous month's developments in in crime and things that we're doing to of course address those issues also and lucy's here uh, probably going to talk about it tonight uh, our neighborhood watch uh, of course which we partner with the sheriff's department um it's 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 10 months a, a year it's uh, we have 10 different areas so that all the city can be covered uh lucy where is it this uh it's Emperor. This, Emperor. it's area Emperor. at emperor school on on this thursday actually mm -hmm. uh so i know lucy will talk about it probably when she gets up but that would be another good way of coming and speaking to sheriffs and our staff about any issues you want to discuss regarding public safety um you know criminal activity things like that and and I know I, I don't want to speak for the, the council, but, but I think we all believe that uh, our, our, we have a, a very good sheriff's uh, department. Our station does a very good job in protecting our city. And those numbers are reflected in how we are tr just about every year awarded one of the safest cities uh, in California. And, and that's in large part due to the efforts of our deputies and, and their staff. And, and we appreciate what you do out there for us. So thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Captain. We we truly appreciate the partnership that we have. Yeah. And thanks for the report tonight. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. All right. And excellent. And as Councilmember Chavez predicted, uh, next I'd like to call Miss Lucy Lee. <laughs>
Sorry, Lucy, I didn't mean to take your uh, thunder, but you'll do a better job okay. explaining it anyway. <laughs> it gets double, it gets sold twice. Yeah, yeah. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, uh, City evening. Staff. Yes, my name is Lucy Liu. I am with the Neighborhood Watch Program of Temple City, the wonderful Temple City Neighborhood Watch Program. And we have our deputy and our sergeant and our captain here tonight. We are starting up, and our very first meeting is this Thursday, as you mentioned. It is at Emperor Elementary in the cafeteria, 5.30 to 7.30 free hot freshly made soft tacos Ooh, so nicely good. chilled beverages you come you find out we have uh, a new set of topics to talk about one repeating topic burglaries but we have a new way to approach the topic for you we actually just got a preview of the presentation at our area leaders meeting before this um, it's great all i can say is it's very engaging it's great please come out and you're not restricted to just area one. We welcome members of the entire city. It's whatever fits your schedule best. And you're welcome to come to more than one meeting if you like, because every meeting people ask different questions. The dynamics change a little bit. So we welcome you to come. So area one is this coming Thursday. Area two will be the third Thursday of February, but I'll be back here to announce the date and location. Uh, again, Emperor Elementary, 5.30 to 7.30. Uh, we have the Sheriff's Department talking about crimes, and then we have the city talking about disaster preparedness. We do live in earthquake zone, uh, and we are witnessing a lot of flooding, mudslides. Thank goodness we are not prone to that, but a broken water main can also uh, cause a flooding that you do not expect to happen. So please come and find out what to do to be prepared for yourself and your family. Uh, and on a separate issue, uh, taking off that hat, putting on a separate hat, uh, American Red Cross needs blood donations. <laughs> please, yes. please, please, please. The Pasadena Blood Center is open seven days a week at various hours, accommodating the working, um, and we want full blood, we want platelets, we want power red, we want everything we need. It's not we want, we need. We are in a very short uh, supply of blood, so please uh, save a life, come donate. Thank you very much. Thank All you, right. Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. Next, I'd like to call up uh, Mr. Julio Ramirez. Good evening, uh, City Council. Good evening, audience. I'm from El Monte. Uh, just to, re to verify what the mayor said, that Temple City and Arcadia have illegal cannabis. That the city of Temple City has cannabis. And I was shocked when he said that, because he even said that all that money will create more for the little kids, my daughter, that's what he said, my daughter will, she knows what is a cannabis, it was passed, but I thank you from the bottom of my heart, the two gentlemen that went over there were treated wrong. They didn't have a seat in front, and it was a shame for not recognizing you guys, to sit you guys in, in, the, in front they, they told you guys, sit outside instead of being right there. And it's a shame. Because if, like he said, I'm sick and tired of people saying the same thing. I'm not repeating the same thing. I know what it is. I'm a cancer survivor. And like he said, he re I mean, even the school district, they went against it. And he still challenged everybody. Well, it was past 53%. Home Depot, Temple City right there. We don't want no more homeless. I respect everybody, but we don't want a lot of things that are gonna give us bad things. I mean, he's not listening, and he's not listening to our law enforcement. Because if he would listen, the sheriff's is doing a great job right here. Okay. Thank you very much very much from the bottom of my heart. But it's on Live Oak in Arcadia where there's a dispensary over there. If you wanna go look at it, you can go look at it. And it's a shame. But thank you very much, you guys stick together. I apologize for anything, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you raise your hands. 
That's a, get that, if you if get you were here thing going right now, huh, don't we? <laughs> if you were here before closed session, you'll understand why they're <laughs> raising their arms. Maybe we can get a wave going. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So next, I'd like to call up uh, Joseph Chun. Is that him? Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, thought he's, he's leaving. I believe he's coming. <laughs> <laughs> I was prepared to uh, speak in the 6.30 section, but after I heard uh, the city um, already, Temple City already filed the lawsuit, I don't think I need to speak anymore to <laughs> against the, the marijuana, but uh, as a pastor, as, as a religious leader, I represent my church, which is located in Temple City, just a few minutes away from the, from the uh, marijuana factory. <laughs> now, as spiritual leader, I believe that God cares for people. Therefore, our, our church cares greatly of our community. And I believe that all authority comes from God and is to be used it for good instead of using it for harming people. And I'm very proud of all our mayor and our council members that I do see you really care and I do see that you really listen to the heart of our people, the resident of Temple City. Thank you so much. Yes. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, Pastor Chun, which, which church uh, yeah. are, you, are you with? <laughs> First yeah. Chinese Baptist Church, St. Gabriel Valley. We oh. just bought the okay. church property on Golden West. Oh. We are going to move oh, in in the, March. The, the okay. Bishop. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, welcome. We want to First Baptist Chinese We want church. to support our city. We want Great. to pray, support our law enforcement, and we they they have been working hard to keep this city safe and sound. And I thank God for them. Okay. Yes. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for speaking. Um, the last speaker form I have here is uh, Miss Feng Liu. Okay. Share one sure. important experience. This Sunday, past Sunday, I talked to the among the city mayor, Quintere. I asked the city mayor, I said, hey, mayor, you know, there's so many open land in Riverside, uh, San Bernardino, Palm Springs. Why don't those uh, marijuana people move to there, you know, cheaper? Don't uh, cause damage for people? He told me, no, they want to stay close to the market. But when the in the November 27th, I heard they said their marijuana is going to sell to far away, some med medical center far away from here. But city mayor told me they want to open here, just want to stay to the market. Where's the market? Temple City is their market. I just want to share this experience. So I think they just pretend to say, you know, for the medical marijuana, but the mayor said that they're close to, they want to stay close to the market. Yeah. So I guess, you know, after I heard this whole, I couldn't sleep, <laughs> I get more stressed out. So I just want to share this. Thank you city council members, thank you, thank you city attorneys. We have to fight really hard, we have no choice. We have to win, otherwise we are their market. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I just, uh, at this point, uh, there are no other speaker requests, but is there anyone from the audience that would like to address the city council at this time? All right, well, seeing none, uh, I will close public comment, and we will move on to the consent calendar on the agenda. Are there any comments or a motion for the consent calendar? Motion to approve. A second. We have a motion and a second for the consent calendar. Can we have a roll call, please? Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Sternquist? Yes. Council Member Yu? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Fish? Yes. Mayor Mann? Yes. So the consent calendar has been approved. We move to the public hearing item 8A, Community Development Block Grant Funds for Fiscal Year 2019-2020. Mr. Cook? 
Thank you, Mayor Mann, members of the council. Before you tonight <coughs> is the required public hearing uh, related to the allocation of CDBG block grant funds. Um, if Adam, I, if I could ask everyone to um, please refrain from speaking too loudly, we do have a meeting to continue. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Cook. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the uh, required public hearing related to the allocation for CDBG funds for fiscal year 2019-2020. Uh, Adam will go over a brief presentation for the council to review and uh, receive any public comments and uh, move forward. Sounds so good. thank you. Thank you. Um, these are our ongoing programs that have been funded for several years now. Our Housing Rehabil Rehabilitation Loan and Grant Program. This program typically assists anywhere from three to four households per year. Uh, there's currently a waiting list of 20 individuals. Um, the Associated Asbestos and Lead-Based Paint Testing and Removal Program. Um, and then also our Youth Scholarship Program, which is limited to 15% of our annual allocation, which is approximately 28,000 per year. And uh, that typically serves anywhere from 80 or issues anywhere 80 to 100 scholarships. Um, the current year programs, these are the balances as of last week. Our housing rehab program currently has uh, 240, almost $248,000. Uh, there is one project that is under construction right now. Um, that will probably total somewhere around 60 or 70,000 and that includes um, administrative costs um, and that includes the asbestos lead program too for that project and then our youth scholarship program that's our balance right now of almost uh, 28,000 uh, that's typically uh, expended usually run out of money by the end of the fiscal year so our anticipated expenditures for the year is approximately 100,000 so uh, if we don't process another uh, rehabilitation project, we could have uh, approximately 200000 for available for next year. Um, these are the estimated annual or allocations for next fiscal year, 190000 which should be kind of in line with what we have right now. Our, non, our known unallocated funds, which is carried over from the previous year, or loans that are paid back from previous uh, home improvement projects, uh, we're about 77,000 there. So our, our known allocation for next fiscal year would be 267,000. Um, if, we, if we expend funds up to what our minimum requirement is, we could have up to an additional 285,000 that would carry over. Um, so we could have a potential allocation of up to 552,509. Um, the City Council did request that staff look into a uh, program that the City of West Covina offers, an economic development program. Uh, essentially just creates jobs um, for low-income individuals. Uh, city of Claremont is the only non-entitlement city out of the 47 cities in the Urban County Plan to offer this type of program. City of Covina previously offered the program. Uh, however, um, they did not find that the program was ex successful and um, there was, I believe, a lack of interest from the business community. Um, they changed the direction for their use of the CDBG funds and I believe um, they program funds to construct or replace, a, I believe it's a senior center in the city. Uh, city of Claremont, uh, as I mentioned previously is the only city that currently offers a program right now um, in the urban county uh, they offer $25,000 uh, $25, forgivable loan for each full-time equivalent employee um, that's in a low-income household uh, typically that loan is forgiven if the if the individual or the full-time equivalent position is um, is held for at least five years I know some cities do kind of a prorated rate if they're unable to keep that full-time position on. Um, the city of West Covina, I know um, the city council uh, was interested in their program because they brought in a popular Cuban bakery. Um, however, they are an entitlement city, so they have over $50,000, so they get funds directly from HUD, and they have probably a big a much bigger allocation than, than the city does, probably over a million dollars. Um, 
So some of the challenges, if the city were to establish a program, uh, we don't know what the interest would be from the community, the business community. Uh, we have um, drawdown requirements that we have to have, so we have to expend funds, a certain amount of funds by the end of March. Um, creating a new program like this would probably take a couple of years. I believe uh, the bakery is not open yet in West Covina. I think it's almost completed. But I believe it's taken at least two or three years for them from the start uh, to finish. Um, uh, one benefit of our home improvement program is that loans are recycled back into the community. So when uh, property owners or participants um, sell their property or pass away or something happens where they have to pay back those loans, um, they're recycled back into our community and we can use them on other future uh, rehab programs. Um, the city would also be required to do an RFP to help bring on a consultant to assist us with the program. Um, there could be potential impacts to our housing element. Right now, we use CDBG funds. Uh, one of the goals of our housing element is to preserve affordable housing. Uh, that goal was 24 units for our current period, which is 2014 to 2021. Uh, we average about three to four projects per year. Uh, so we are on pace to, to meet that, that goal of 24 units. Um, if we use a portion of CDBG funds, we would need to look for an alternative funding source to um, keep that program active. Um, if we fail to do that, we could be out of compliance with our housing element and, and could um, lose potential funding for affordable housing. Um, so with that, staff recommends that the council adopt the ongoing programs in these amounts. Um, and I'm available if you have any questions. Thank you. Uh, are there any council questions at this time? Um, so it sounds to me that, like, if we were to consider this, uh, extending this program to a, a business or economic development component, that there's some more homework that needs to be done here. Um, maybe some outreach. Um, and so I don't know if that's something that we could talk about at a later time or maybe staff could look at maybe getting the assistance of the Chamber of Commerce or, or something of that nature so that we could, one, I would wanna know if there's even an interest in it before we would consider doing something like this, um, um, whether maybe Maybe there have been businesses or business owners that have come asked about it. I don't know. Um, but to me, I think uh, probably a little premature. Need a little bit more information on that. Otherwise, uh, I don't have any other questions regarding the rest of it. Thank you. Council Member Stern. A couple of questions. Um, Adam, the um, home loans that are paid back, how many of those have been paid back in the last, say, the last five years? We probably get anywhere from two to three a year. And the average being the 20, top end? Uh, 25000 is usually the amount that they're paying. paid back. And then does that money get recycled in for the year that the loan is paid back? No, so it goes back into our unallocated balance, and then we could use that on current year funds or save it for the following fiscal year. Okay, and then is that just dependent on whether or not we have a waiting list? I mean, I know it is that we have, what, 20 people on a waiting list. So how, do, how is the decision made to either, you know, do it this year or move it to the next year? Um, we typically just wait for the following fiscal year because we would need to do, a, possibly do an amendment depending on how much funds we're moving. But wouldn't it make more, maybe not more sense, but you'd get more people f off that waiting list if you did it in the same fiscal year that the money was paid back? Yeah, there there is some time going in and qualifying people for the program. So the our, our consultant tries not to get too many people um, qualified for the program. We, she usually does, in, usually around two people at a time 
gets them start get, starts getting them qualified, doing the back um, uh, processing bids and getting information on the work that they would need to do. So, how long is that process from the time an applicant gets started in the process? It's probably about four months. That seems like an awful long time. Yeah, <laughs> there's a, there's a lot of work that goes into it. I'm just thinking you can get a home loan in 30 days, and you, I, I'm sure it's a little bit more stringent, but these days it's very difficult to get home loans too. I'm just wondering if maybe that process could be looked at to see if there's a way to, I'm sure like when it's close to the end of the fiscal year, obviously there's not enough time to do that, but right. if there's any way to have that, the consultant look at getting more people through there, that process to get off the waiting list. There is an issue too with qualifying. There, the income documentation that we have to have is only valid for, I believe it's 90 days. So that's another reason why we don't get too many people kind of in the pipeline. Because if, <laughs> if it's past 90 days, then we need to get all their information and requalify them for the, to make sure that they're under the income threshold. Do you think we need, is, is she a part-time consultant or? Right yeah. now, right now we have we have a uh, Wildan uh, through a contractor who provides that um, provides that service as well. Um, so, um, and there are only certain kind of qualified uh, consultants that HUD feels comfortable with, and through us through uh, the CDC feels comfortable with too, because our our CDB fund use does eventually will eventually get audited. <laughs> it hasn't been audited in my time. I'm here, but they want to make sure that the, the consultants that you're using have the experience with these programs and the, and the intricacies of the qualification requirements and everything else. But we can ask the consultant to just look at the process a little bit more, see where things, while not violating any of the uh, programmatic issues that related to the program, see where we can speed some things up a little bit. The other issue, too, related to that is, um, uh, because of the the increased interest we've had in the program over the last few years, um, we we don't want to, for lack of a better term, start to oversubscribe people as well into the program. So that's right. we're playing a little cautious in the on that front, to be honest. But um, we can ask the consultant to see Thanks. where where there's some things that she can try to uh, help accelerate a little bit. Right, because if it takes four months the process but <clears throat> you're kicked out of it in thir in 90 days yeah. and yeah, then you have to start it seems like that can be a vicious cycle and somewhat frustrating for the people that are applying for the loans I've worked I've worked in both in, on non entitlement and entitlement cities and um, there is a general sometimes frust uh, there, the, the process can be a little bit frustrating as well we went through even a more laborious project in my prior agency as well where some of those requirements made uh, programmatic, the, the programmatic decision making process was laborious to say the least at times. So, but we can ask the consultant okay. to see, see where as long as we're meeting all the programmatic guidelines and regulatory uh, guidelines that where they can kind of move things along. Okay. And is there any difference in the timeline between the handyman program and the other loan? The grant does take less time. You don't have to go through with um, doing the title or title search on the property to make sure that there aren't any loan or liens on the property. But that is also a lien on the property, correct? No. That is not a lien not on the right. property? So that's just a qualification through Wilden also? Right. Yep. Okay. And then one last question. Uh, I read that um, s the funding can be used to right wrongs in building code violations, <laughs> but if a code enforcement officer identifies a code violation and says this needs to be, you know, upgraded. Does that person who has that code violation still has to fall within the moderately low category? Also correct. We're not using funding from this program to encourage someone who's using a build who has a building code violation and encouraging them to apply for this it ha they have to meet the same stringent requirements correct right um, our consultant when they go out if they see something that isn't permitted then they would use those funds to address that situation so Some, that would be the first priority of someone that was applying for that loan would right. be 
Because there's a maximum, correct? Correct. Is it 35000 35000 yes. So say it was $34,000. They'd have to use that $34,000 to fix the code violation and not, I want my house painted and the roof, and or I want to put fix my central air conditioning in. Right. Yeah, okay. we, we could combine it with uh, grants, so that would be an option too. But the grant's okay. only 10000 Okay, thank you. Do we have additional questions? I do have one. Um, doesn't seem like this program is helping too many people. I'm reading here from 14, since 1415, we have helped 11 below moderate income households. And then for the, um, for the Henny Man uh, program, um, I'm losing my place here. We have, we have helped 14. So how many households do you expect uh, in the coming year that this program will help? Um, As a matter of fact, we would not be spending all four hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, right? For the next not, fiscal yeah, year, it it depends. Uh, so let me back up. Another thing too is when our consultant goes out to a property, right. it de she will talk to the to the property owner and see whether or not they what kind of improvements they they need on the property. So it could be minor things as painting. Then she would use the um, the grant funds for that. But if it's a major case where you need to use grant and loans, then it could be anywhere up to you know $45,000. So it, she has to go through the list and do the site visit and see what actual improvements need to be done first. These are, I guess, hot guidelines and you have to follow. Right. Okay. Mayor Platoon. I have a question. Um, there's a section here that says that we can use it um, for special population groups such as disabled and seniors. And I was wondering um, regarding the housing rehabilitation loans, do you know how many are seniors? Or can you give me a guess? I don't know the exact number, but I know a majority of them are. Majority? Yeah. And would you say that's also the same thing for the asbestos? Because I know they kind of go Yeah, there's usually hand. hand in hand, yeah. Okay. So really, we are helping the seniors yeah. indirectly. Okay. Thank you. That's my only question. Okay. I would think that would be true since they're usually the ones that can qualify because they don't have right. a whole lot of income. income. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Okay. Well, if there's no further uh, questions, I'd like to open this up for public comment. Is there anyone who would like to make a comment on this item at this point? All right, seeing none, I will close public comment. Is there any further council discussion on this item? Mayor, man, I just want to make one comment that just to remind everyone that part of this allocation is for this youth scholarship program. Um, and that, and as I spoke with our director of Rosa today, those, those funds are available only to our city youth programs, um, not to any other youth organizations in the city. However, there is another fund. Kathy, refresh my recollection. What it, what's the other fund that we Camellia use? Camellia Fund. That? Camellia Fund. Uh, sorry? Camellia Trust Fund. The Camellia Trust Fund. The Camellia Trust Fund, yeah. Um, that's available to other organizations, other youth organizations, soccer, Little League football, that can apply to that. So uh, we've got pretty much the whole group covered there. So that's, I just wanted to point that out. Okay. Just one last thing. I've always, since I've been on city council, have always looked at CDBG funds and encourage staff to look at some creative, innovative ways that possibly CDBG funds could be used um, in addition to the two programs that we have. We've had these programs for a very long time, and I know they have been successful, people like them, but I think it's a, it seems that with the creativity we have on our staff, I always, I'm waiting for staff to come up with some wonderful new innovative um, CDBG program that can reach out to a larger population in our city. And, and whether that's you know a group of seniors or just some something other than the two programs that we've had that have been institutional in our city for a very long time. Because I think we we could probably do continue to do them, but also do something that's creative and innovative and just encourage our staff to think outside of the box and 
maybe bring some ideas back that I can't think of because you're the experts. <laughs> so just a thought. Well, that's something maybe we might want to discuss with maybe some of our other colleagues in the Valley mm -hmm. and see if there's anything out there that maybe they're doing and see mm -hmm. if it's feasible in our city. Cause uh, yeah, I was I mean, just going to say, ask. last year uh, I had the honor of attending the award ceremony that um, Judy Chu had where she gave out all the awards for the, the different programs. And it was really kind of amazing all the different programs that all of our surrounding cities are doing with this money. I'm sure we could get that list and see what they're doing. Great idea. Thank you. Anyway. Any additional comments? Mm -hmm. All right, if, if not, uh, may I have a motion for this item? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll move to authorize the city manager amend CDBG funded program allocation up to 90%. Um, throughout the fiscal percent. year? I think, it's I think you mean 50%? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, 50%. Sorry, sorry. And um, need new glasses. And adopt resolution 195379, establishing the CDBG funded programs and allocation for the fiscal year 2019 to 20. I'll second. All right. We have a motion and a second. May we have a roll call for that motion, please? Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Sternquist? Yes. Council Member Yu? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Fish? Yes. Mayor Mann? Yes. All right, so that motion carries unanimously and we move on to the second item on the public hearing, item B, introduction and first reading of ordinance 18-1032 amending title nine, chapter one of the Temple City Municipal Code. Thank you, Mayor Mann, members of the council. Before you tonight is uh, proposed code amendments to the zoning code. Um, this is in lieu of the zoning code update that we'll be doing, um, some immediate issues. This was on the agenda uh, back in November, but um, asked for some uh, continuances going forward. Uh, Mr. Reamers, our planning manager, will go over a basic overview uh, and introduction, and Adam will provide uh, some detail presentation of tonight's uh, proposed amendments. Great. Uh, yes, good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, before you tonight are the Series 2 code amendments. As we implement the zoning code every day, um, we slowly put together throughout a year a list of things that need to be clarified in the code where there's some ambiguity. Um, sometimes we find that there's duplicate text in the code, which is not best practice. It's good to have state something only once. Um, sometimes we find there's definitions in the code of words that are never even used in the code. So we've, from once a year, we try to come back and provide a list of some things that need to be um, revised. Um, these changes usually are changes that are consistent with the intent of the code, um, intent, uh, consistent with the practices that have been in place for a number of years, and now we just need to come to the place where we codify those practices. Um, so um, Adam will go through some of those changes um, with you, uh, but one of the, some of the changes I wanted to focus on in this introduction are those to the accessory dwelling unit ordinance. The state passed the accessory dwelling unit ordinance back in 2016. It came into effect in 2017. And an accessory dwelling unit is a, like a second unit in a single family neighborhood. Um, when the city council adopted its ordinance um, back in 2017, um, after conversation with the city attorney's office, we adopted an ordinance that was um, very similar to the state ordinance. Um, over time though, the state housing and community development department uh, released a memo which said that cities could adopt a more restrictive ordinance. And so many jurisdictions um, surrounding us did such. They adopted some more um, strict requirements. Um, on the heels of the general plan, which talks about protecting single family neighborhoods, um, we looked at what was happening in the area and came back to the Planning Commission with some recommendations on how to tighten that, along with some additional changes that have happened at the state. Um, the Planning Commission asked us to look at a little bit more some of those restrictions and asked us to kind of tighten it down a little bit further. Um, so we came back to the Planning Commission in the end of last year um, with some additional restrictions on the maximum size of these units, um, the maximum number of bedrooms and so forth. Um, so you know um, we've had in planning 104 applications for ADUs um, since January of 2017 and um, about 60 of those have moved on to the building permit process where building permits have been issued. Um, so just to give you an, an extent for the popularity of, of those um, 
within the community. Um, with that, I'll just, just a quick question. Yes. Um, I don't know, if, and I'm not sure if you have the numbers. I probably should have asked this earlier uh, to have you prepared for it. But of those 104 or 60 that have kind of moved to the permanent process, do they fall um, within the proposed changes, or are they? All, all, all of those would fall under the existing ordinance as the council adopted it back in 2017. Okay. Um, anything submitted after the date that the council approves this ordinance would have to comply with the new requirements. Well, I guess what I'm asking also is that, let's say for example, of those 60, or how many of them are, are over 800 square feet? That I don't know off the top okay, of my head. I, I do know we, we've had, we've approved some that are over 800, but okay. I don't know the number off. Yeah. Up to 1,200. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Well, I, I do have a similar kind of question. As we try to pose the cities uh, or making the ADU a little bit more restrictive to the city's um, taste or desire, if, if you will, um, there's this one requirement at ADU that always bugs me, which is allowing people to <laughs> convert the building without having to add the garage, garage parking. parking. And I was reading in the proposed amendment, so you're still saying that prior to 2017, if they were built prior to 2017, they still can do that. Is, is that, uh, do we have any room to tighten that anymore? To, um, make, to not allow it at all? At all? Uh, unfortunately, the state law um, the state law that was adopted back in 2016 and that was implemented by in 2017 said that when you convert a garage, you do not need to provide additional parking. Um, so th what the so the state reason state for that state was state. was that we had an ordinance, and many cities had an ordinance for second units. And one of the major reasons why people didn't build second units was because we required them to provide garages. Right, right, right. In mm -hmm. response, the state said, okay, we're gonna change these garage requirements statewide. But but that is not one requirement we can restrict. That's true. not one we can modify. Okay. Yeah. Right. That's my question, thank you. So I'll jump in here in the definition section. Um, so as Scott mentioned earlier, there's some duplicate language. Um, the first one is the building accessory. Um, it just clarifies that accessory dwelling units have a different height requirement, and that's specified in the ADU section of the zoning code. Uh, the next one is uh, the measurement of a building or structure in the R1 zone. Uh, there's a different height measurement for some reason on the R1 zone. So. It's just adding some text to clarify that um, structures in the R1 zone, you would need to look in the R1 zone to see how that's measured. Um, detached living quarters, that, um, that definition was eliminated with the AD, the creation of the AD ordinance. So that's just some language that was carried over and un unintentionally left in. Um, the next section, uh, which is still section one, page two and three of the ordinance, uh, this would re remove a reference to guest house and sec second units. So that um, text was eliminated from the from when the city established or created the ADU ordinance. Uh, so it's just removing some old language. Um, the next one is regarding lot areas. So the existing code um, specifically does not include um, flood control easements, and since, it, since it's not usable in terms of calculating. Um, things related to lot area, density, floor error ratio, or permeable area. Uh, so staff has had the practice of not including the driveway easements for a uh, flag lot, which the example is there on the screen, or a tiered lot uh, where you have a shared driveway for m multiple properties. Um, staff has not counted that area towards the um, requirements in as far as doing lot coverage uh, since you cannot build uh, something on that area. Uh, Mr. Gullick, the question is, does that yes. mean that you know, are now building a little less now? Correct. Right, right. So, I mean, you use the, when you calculate how, uh, how much floor area that you can build, you would, it, you would not include the driveway easement. Correct. Thanks. Uh, so the next section is a definition of um, lot er, or lot or parcel of land. Um, there's some duplicate language and also incorrect language um, 
or there's duplicate language that's in the R1 standards, and there's also some incorrect language uh, that relates to old development standards, so uh, it's recommended to strike that out. Um, definition of uh, front yard area would be modified or clarified to specify. Uh, right now, it's anything uh, in front of a structure on the property that would be modified to say where it's uh, in line with the front of a house. Uh, this would prevent an accessory structure or garage or some other type of structure to be built in front of the house. Um, if it's attached to the house, then it would be counted towards that. Um, so you cannot have a garage in front yet, like I, I thought that diagram was indicating. We, so we're trying to get away from what people have been doing is creating a detached garage. So what you end up having is a house that's set back 60 or 80 or 90 feet away from the street. Okay. But still you cannot build in the front yard though. That's correct. Okay. What, what if the garage was attached to the house on the front? Then it would be, if it was attached to the house, then the, the measure, or it would be the front of the garage. Be the front of yeah, many of the new homes we have, their garages yeah. are attached. Mm -hmm. you know, in the front. Yeah. So we, we've seen a trend of detached we're garages. We're measured to the front of the garage and not to the house. That's, that's correct. When, when a garage is attached to a house, that becomes one structure, right. and then the front yard would go up to the front of the garage. Mm -hmm. Front of the garage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the next section is removing uh, some old language in the con conditional use permit section, uh, administrative review pro or administrative conditional use permit and transfer stations. Uh, we removed that language uh, in a previous code amendment. Um, excessive noise, uh, this simplifies the noise section. Yeah. Uh, so one of the reasons why this change is being proposed is that um, we get calls um, regarding noise complaints from neighbors on the weekends when new single family houses are being built. Um, the Planning Commission has a standard condition of approval that um, does not allow any um, construction on Sundays or holidays. Um, that's usually for multifamily or a condominium project or something like a flag lot. Just to get back to that real quick on the yes. construction noise. So in going over this, I, I know you guys did a pretty good survey of the surrounding cities. And I, I noticed that there were a few cities that limited the construction uh, during the week till 6 o'clock p.m., mm -hmm. which in my mind I think makes more sense because, first of all, if anybody who's ever gone through a, a neighbor doing construction knows that it can be quite bothersome, quite noisy, um, you know, I, I just think that putting it, leaving it at 7 o'clock in the evening Basically, you know that contractor is probably not going to get out of there till 7:30 or 8, um, <coughs> and so I'm kind of in favor of doing what some of these other cities, and that is leaving it at 7 o'clock a.m. and going to 6 6 p.m. during during the week. And they're always going to have a little fudge area in there, probably to 6:30. And I'm just thinking that's generally a, you know dinner time. People are getting home from work. Um, be nice to be have a little bit of quiet time uh, and to be honest with you most of the contractors I know aren't working past six o'clock uh, most of them that I know don't even work till six o'clock uh, especially if they're starting at seven in the morning so uh, I, I don't see the reason why it you know I don't know where those those numbers necessarily came up but they've probably been there a long time but uh, that would be the only kind of change that I would probably like to see in the proposal is uh, keep the Saturdays uh, eight to four which is fine I like the idea of nothing on Sunday or, or holidays, and then uh, rather than seven to seven on Monday through Friday, seven to six. I, I don't know how my colleagues feel about that, but uh, I just thought it'd be something that we might want to take a look at. I I think generally construction they tend to go with whenever the sun's up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe the seven to seven was with the intention of allowing more construction to occur during the summer. But I, I understand which, where you're coming yeah. from. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, but like I said, my, my thinking is that if we give them seven to seven, they're going to go seven to eight. Uh, well, uh, I agree, especially for the homeowners that are doing their own 
yeah. work because sometimes they get home from work and then they're working on their house from yeah, five to slamming, seven slamming, uh, using power tools yeah. and different things, exactly. you know. And I mean, I feel bad because they're doing the regular job and then they're working on their house, but still we have to hear it. So well, I would agree. Well, you figure seven to six, that's still 11 hours of work right. time. Right, I agree. I mean, if you can't get something done in 11 hours a day. Um, mm. You know, and then, the, and then the other thing is, you know, there are, there are certain uh, contractors that do side jobs, which they'll do, you know, a job during the day and then they'll do one in the afternoon as an extra, and they'll probably try to go right up till that seven. Yeah. I, I'm just, I'm agreeing with you. No, I can't, thank you. I, I just think it's, uh, I, I don't know if we've heard from any contractors or there's a, Has anybody there's a big, said, no. there's gonna be a big protest or something <laughs> like that, but. Uh, no, yeah. Most of the contractors, um, our regular contractors, wrap up by four or five o'clock. Yeah, that's, that's right. been my experience. Yeah, most of the time they're the contract right. quit they're about three home. to four. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. I think the only trouble is something like to start six in the summer because it's nice yeah, and cool. Start and, later and then Right, and then later. they go. But I think the longer hours really apply to homeowners. Mm -hmm. Homeowners I, are the I one agree. that's banging away on weekends <laughs> and nights. And yeah, but they would still be controlled <laughs> by this law. Right. right. So right. that's, well, so I, mean, I think we need to kind of think think about our own do-it-yourself homeowners too. We don't want to limit so much. Um, I agree on holidays, Sundays, but um, regular weekdays, I don't think seven to seven is excessive, um, I think. Do, do we know, do we get a lot of noise complaints? I'm we, just wondering, I mean, is it? We, we, do, sun, we do get Saturday noise morning. complaints every once in a while. Um, we do get a lot of questions about, is it okay to work on holidays? What are the hours um, on weekends? So we get a lot of questions and we get some complaints about it. Okay. Yes. See, uh, my problem with the neighbor issue is that you want to be a good neighbor, so you don't right. personally want to go tell your neighbor, right. hey, well, you still working on your house. At least if we <laughs> have it codified, at least they do know that, look, it says six o'clock, you know, I mean, Okay, go to 6.30, but you know, not till 7.30, 8 o'clock, which is I know what they're gonna do if we say till 7 o'clock. There's gonna be an, an extra hour in there somewhere. Um, so. However, speaking for do-it-yourselfers, and maybe I'm one of them, um, you know, if you, you can't really work during the week because you have to go to work and you come home and you only have Saturday to work and you're already not unable to work on That's Sunday, so. I mean, so the, the days of, that you can work, it work a little longer. Yeah, it sounds like most of the complaints are on the weekend or on weekends. I think. Uh, or on holidays. Uh, and morning, not, right? Our, our, our most, most, of most of our complaints oh, about mornings, really? six o'clock, yeah, weekends, yeah, weekends and holidays. Yeah. yeah. When it's cool. Starting bef uh, before 7 a.m. Yeah. It's not the late, it's the morning one that, that, yeah. So go 8 to 7. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting that hour somewhere. <laughs> Well, I just thought I'd bring it up. I, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, it's not an issue for me personally, but at least not now. But uh, well, we'll see. If it if we start getting some complaints, we can always change it. I suppose, yep. right? Have we? We haven't really gotten any formal complaints with the hours that we have now, other than because no. you said the weekends and right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I like the idea of no Sundays and and holidays. I, I think that's a good change. So. All right. Thank you. All right. The next section is um, removing or removes the reference to second unit. So that was taken out as part of the ADU section or ADU ordinance. Um, and we currently, uh, what council member you was speaking on earlier uh, regarding the replacement spaces in the driveway, we currently don't have a, a parking standard for that. So we would establish a, a standard uh, similar to what is in the uh, guest parking, the residential guest parking spaces. Uh, so that would be the new uh, standard for that. Um, this next section uh, relates to fences. Now there wouldn't, there won't be any changes to fence height requirements for residential properties. Um, they're currently in the in the zoning code. There's no direction for how uh, fences is measured or the height of a fence is measured when there's a change in grade. So it's more addressing those situations. Um, um, this section um, would address the walls and fences in the front yard. Um, so uh, 
would allow for if there's a when there's less than 12 inches uh, difference in grade uh, if you're at the front property line uh, sometimes contractors or developers are required to install a sidewalk so they, they would need to do some grading uh, we've had some situations with new developments where um, they have a situation like this where they regrade the public right-of-way install a sidewalk uh, install a fence and then when I go out there to measure the fence the fence exceeds the maximum height requirements so uh, this provides a little bit of leniency um, still trying to address the to make sure that the height isn't or the height of the wall isn't too high in the front yard um, if you have a situation where there's a much larger uh, change in grade which isn't too common in the city um, but if if there is something that's over 12 inches up to three feet you could have a retaining wall but in this situation we would want to have a three foot setback from that that wall retaining wall um, this would just allow um, a lower uh, fence in that front yard um, you could if you were to just allow a fence on top of the retaining wall you could have a fence anywhere from um, four to five feet tall maybe even six feet tall um, so this just addresses um, that that type of situation and allows uh, someone to still have a three foot tall fence but just stagger it a little bit and I have um, some examples here on on what it would look like on the right side um, and then what we're trying to prevent on the left side where you have a change in grade but then they have a fence on top of that kind of retaining wall. Um, uh, this next section um, addresses on a corner lot. So on the lot where you have a sh uh, street or the side yard uh, would also require um, a three foot setback. We allow fences up to six feet if it's on a corner lot on the side yard. Um, so it would also require that three-foot um, setback. Uh, Mr. Gullick, yes. in the case of the three-feet setback, we have a language that addresses the landscaping between the two fences because we, we require don't, but the any, anything. That could be addressed during the site plan review process. Yeah, you might want to think about that because otherwise that becomes a no man's land and just dirt and wheat. Um, okay. Uh, so the next, this next section addresses um, height of a fence on an interior side property line. So what we have now is a situation on the left where someone uh, regrades their site. Um, they bring in additional dirt and then the existing neighbor on the right side their lot is a little bit lower uh, right now we require the, the that wall to be measured from the lowest point um, so what it does is it creates this awkward situation where you basically see the upper part of the person their torso up that's looking over into your neighbors or into the neighbor's yard so uh, we would change that requirement and say that you can measure measure the height of a wall uh, on these interior side and rear yards from the um, the highest point um, so that just allows additional privacy for that existing lot um, on the right there so you allow and under this proposal up to nine feet then on right if they have a retaining wall it's not very common to have such a high change in grade but there are some situations hmm. that's a pretty tall wall yes and it and this is just one of those judgment calls um about what what is the appropriate height for that so what the code says as it's being recommended is retaining walls up to three feet are not counted towards the maximum height if you think nine feet is too high, then we would just change that requirement. So retaining walls up to, and you could replace that with two feet or one foot, um, it's whatever you feel more comfortable with. It's just one of those judgment calls. So it's nine feet on one side, but six feet on the other. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. assuming the guy on the left was the one building it and you're the one on the right, then you end up looking at a nine foot wall behind your house. I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Might like that. 
and and working in other cities where hillside development is more common, yeah. you you see people argue it on both sides. It's yeah. uh, sometimes people would prefer that nine foot wall because they want the privacy, and then in other cases people say, "What am I going to do with this big nine foot wall? It's hideous." And okay. so it's it's one of those calls that are sometimes I'll, hard I'll to make. I'll leave it alone and see if anybody complain about it. Yeah, I, I, I can't imagine we have too many lots like that in the city. No. It, it's unusual to have that amount of change in grade. We've been instituting on new houses some stricter requirements. Of about how much grade you can change. Yeah. So we're seeing it less and less. I, I thought the uh, code says no more than 12 inches, right? Yes, so. it, the design guidelines say no more than 12. So that's what we try to hold the uh, developers okay. to. And we've been working harder and harder on that on the last few years. So, so and at most, you're looking at seven foot wall. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you have, unless it's an old project, right? right. Um, so this next section, um, there currently is no direction in the code to how to measure the height of a wall along a slope. Uh, so this would just establishment, establish uh, that you would measure at any point along that, that slope. Um, this next section is new. Um, this is, uh, we don't have any development standards for non-residential zones. Um, our downtown specific plan does have standards, um, so staff has recommended um, these maximum height limits and we have some design standards too. So it's basically four feet on a front or corner lot, uh, maximum height of a wall. Uh, you could go up to eight feet on an interior rear lot um, and then step down if you're, as you get closer to the street. And if you bought a residential property, then you would just be limited by those uh, development standards, the height requirements. Uh, these are some of the development standards um, require that the fence be 50% open along the front and corner lot uh, that use uh, stucco or split face when it's closer to the property line, uh, requiring a landscape buffer and then limiting chain link to the interior side and rear yards. Uh, Mr. Golick, um uh, Ms. Reem, how many, do you know uh, cities that actually outright ban chain link at all, oh even goodness. for interiors? I, I can't recall off the top of my head. Okay. Yeah. Just curious because yeah. I really don't like it, like chain link. <laughs> I was gonna say, do, like you, do you know? I don't know well, of oh. one, so that's why I was the, the downtown, I believe the downtown specific plan does not allow chain link. Uh, you have to use like a wrought iron type yeah. um, fence. Um, I, th I think we would probably mostly only find that in the industrial zone. Yeah, I think most of our new residential developments, I can't think of one. I can't, yeah, e I yeah. can't either. Chain link looks pretty, looks, looks pretty bad. Pretty yeah, 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 yeah. I think most of yeah. the ones I see are rented. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's still some around temporary. some of the yeah, older the ones right. residentials that I see, but many new developments now. Okay. One of your pet peeves. Yeah, I don't <laughs> like changing. Yeah. Uh, so the next the next section would um, be Ooh, prohibiting oh dangerous yeah, exactly. uh, fence <laughs> materials. Um, I was so just thinking about that. Barbed wires. <laughs> um, so we would prohibit these items unless it's a we would provide an exemption for utility public utility company or government agency. Uh, they will be allowed to have this. Uh, however, you would have to have there be a minimum height that they would need to be above the public right of way, the adjacent, which would be seven feet. Uh, this next section addresses um, cantilevering on the side yard of a property on an interior lot. Um, so the existing code allows for the situation on the left. It still technically meets the side yard setback requirement. The minimum is five feet on a 50 foot wide lot. Um, if we institute this standard where we only allow a four foot cantilever on the side yard, you would have a much larger setback on that side yard. Um, and this next section is just some conflicting language in the R3, the multifamily zoning code um, relating to permeable area requirement. Uh, staff has been implementing the higher requirement of 40%, which is similar to the R2 standards. Uh, this also kind of goes in line with, this, with the city's low impact development requirements or the LID requirements. 
uh, which the intention is to increase the um, surface area where water is retained on site. Um, this next section is the accessory dwelling unit that um, Mr. Rumors com commented on earlier. Um, this is direction from the Planning Commission and uh, reviewing the standards for neighboring cities. Um, the R zones, all the other R zones have minimum size units per bedroom. Um, so staff would recommend in, uh, requiring a minimum uh, unit size uh, per bedroom. Uh, there would be no minimum requirement for a studio. If you had a one bedroom, you need to have a minimum of 600 square feet. And then if you had two bedrooms, you need a minimum of 700 square feet. And um, this would also reduce the maximum size, which is currently 1,200 square feet to 800 square feet, which is similar to what other jurisdictions have. So if you have a two bedroom under the new code, that can go, it has to be at least 700 square feet for those two bedrooms? Correct. So that leaves you 100 square feet for the rest of the dwelling? Well, no, so this would be a minimum for you to have your bedrooms, your kitchen, your living room area. You'd have to have at least 700 oh, square feet. Total. Oh, so total. 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 Okay, so it's just not, that just doesn't keep a bedroom. Right. It leaves a little bit. It's a pretty big bedroom. That's to be a small, uh, small bathroom. Yeah. All right, thank you. And uh, I, I guess one question I had was, what was the sort of thought process or motivation behind reducing the maximum ADU size from 1,200 to 800? Um, that was so um, oh. one of the one of the guiding principles that we had with the general plan was to protect single-family neighborhoods mm -hmm. so with that kind of understanding with the general plan um, we looked at how we could take what the original ordinance we had plus the direction from the state housing community development department and um, uh, tighten up our ordinance um, after we presented those modifications to the Planning Commission, they asked us to look at some additional modifications. Um, and one of those concerns they had was this, the maximum size of 1,200 and whether we could bring that down to something more reasonable. I think their concern was that 1,200 seemed like a very large unit, um, didn't seem like it was really accessory to the main structure, um, that it was bordering on more like a duplex than on a, like a granny flat. Mm -hmm. Um, so those were some of the things that we heard at Planning Commission. Yeah, I, I would agree. A 12, that's almost another new house. Yeah. A small house, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and not, that, that what I would think of as an accessory. My daughter's house is yeah. And, yeah. and that would be it's irrespective <laughs> of the size of the main house. Right. Okay. And irrespective of the size of the lot, as long as you meet the 6,000 6, square feet minimum. Yep. Okay. What was the, way back when we had the ADU, what well, was before the state came along, was it 800 also, the uh, maximum? Do you, Do you remember? Was it 640. 640. I think it was 600. 600, 600. 600. even smaller. Yeah, it was even smaller. Okay. Thank you. So this next change um, would prevent someone from constructing an accessory structure that has more relaxed standards and then someone coming back and trying to convert it into an ADU. Mm -hmm. So um, this January 1st, 2017 is the date when the state ADU law went into effect. So um, if the structure was complete before that time had a building permit, then we would allow for a conversion. But we don't want someone coming in and building an, an accessory structure whether it's five feet or a much smaller setback in the rear or side yard, and then their real intention was to just convert this structure in the end, um, which doesn't meet the requirements. You know, we have now a minimum 10 foot setback in the rear and a five on the side. So that it just addresses um, that type of situation. And the, um, we establish a new minimum lot size requirement for an ADU, which would be 6,000 square feet. Um, the next section addresses the uh, parking spaces, which um, updates it to be consistent with the state law. 
our existing requires one space per bedroom, but the state actually relaxed that to uh, one space per ADU. Um, and then also, this also goes in line with the language up, fr um, up above, which adds that date where if you convert your garage or an accessory structure, you don't need to replace those required parking spaces. The next section is open space. Um, as part of when we established our accessory dwelling unit ordinance, we had a minimum open space requirement of 400 square feet. And the main house also needs a minimum of 500 square feet. So you need a total of 900 square feet. Um, the existing code specifically prohibits the rigard setback from being counted towards that yard area. Um, so staff is recommending to eliminate that language and to be able to count that area. Uh, and also, uh, it currently allows accessory structures within that open space, so we would want to strike that language so it's op actual open usable area. The next section would modify the maximum accessory structures with that proposed 800 square foot uh, ADU size limit, so it's essentially just a 400 square foot reduction. Um, with that, that completes my presentation. I'm available if you have any questions. Do we have any council questions at this point? Council I think we yeah. asked them along yeah. the way. So. No. Okay. Just thank you. I, I do have one. Of In the Planning Commission staff report where you have the tables explaining the modifications to the ordinance as well as the explanation and analysis. Uh, for the ordinance section eight regarding the ADU sizes, maybe I'm, I'm not sure if I'm reading this correctly, but uh, it says one bedroom units must contain at least 640 square feet of gross floor area. And then two bedroom units must contain at least 900 square feet of gross floor area and cannot exceed 1,200 square feet. So if we limit it to yeah. 800, then that would not be necessary or? That was from a previous staff report where we were keeping the 1,200 square feet oh, and then the planning, the planning commission wanted okay. directed staff to survey adjacent cities to see okay. what their standards are. Mm. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, if there's um, no other council questions at this time, I'd like to open up the public hearing for public comment. Is there anyone who would like to make a comment on this item? Jerry? Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, Good evening. Jerry Jambazian. and I just had a question, just for ambiguity's sake. I just wonder if it would be proper to say federal holidays rather than just holidays. Uh, it's, it's Kwanzaa. Can I, uh, uh, you know, do my construction? Uh, it's Groundhog Day. Can I do my construction? I mean, would you want to limit it to federal holidays or just holidays? So that was my only question. I think it is. It, the language it, is federal holidays. Oh, in the slide that I saw, it just said holidays. I think in our staff report, it referred to federal holidays, I believe. Correct. The ordinance does state federal holidays. Yeah, sorry, oh, okay. Jerry. I was just looking at the slide. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to speak on this item? All right. Seeing none, uh, I will close the public comment. Any further council discussion? Nope. Council, okay. Uh, may I have a motion for this item? Mayor Man, I would propose a motion that we uh, introduce for first reading by title only and waive further reading of ordinance number 18 1032, amending title 9, chapter 1 of the Tempest City Municipal Code, and schedule the second reading of ordinance 18 1032 for February 5th, 2019. A second. All right, we have a motion and a second. May we have a roll call, please? Council Member Travis? Yes. Council Member Sternquist? Yes. Council Member Yu? Yes. Mayor Pro Tempish? Yes. Mayor Mann? Yes. All right. That motion has carried unanimously. And we will move on to item 8C, which is the adoption of resolution 19 5373 to approve an amended master fee and fine schedule 
for fiscal year 1819. Mayor, ma'am, members of members of the council, uh, before you tonight is uh, consideration of a master fee schedule. Um, this has been reviewed by the uh, ad hoc of council member uh, Sternquist and council member Chavez, but just to talk generally about fees. Um, this is really beyond the exciting world of uh, fee schedules and those kind of things in municipal government. This is really about a policy question for you as the council. Um, you, ha you said uh, different fees for different things. And the fee schedule is really about what you recover in terms of the cost of the services you're providing. And that's a policy decision you're making. You're either making an economic development policy decision about what you want to subsidize or not subsidize. In the form, I'll just give the uh, example of recreation fees. We make the conscious decision that we are not going to recover a certain percentage of those uh, of cost related to recreation fees because of the public benefit. Uh, in terms of building and safety activities, we make the, you've already approved that. You've made the conscious decision about recovering 100% of the cost related to that. Same thing here, too. This is a policy decision on the council's part about what they want to essentially subsidize and not subsidize in terms of, of the cost of those services. So that, that is a decision of the council. Um, right now we recover uh, about 75% of the costs related to public works, public, uh, public safety and planning activities. Um, and uh, that hoc did review and uh, come back to you with a recommendation of 100% cost recovery of those, of those fees. And those are, th those are before you tonight for your consideration. But just to talk, rather than talking very bureaucratically about fees, it's, Fees are also about the policy decision of the council about where you, where, you, where, what things do you are you willing to kind of subsidize the cost of, and where do you feel from a policy standpoint where you you want to make those adjustments. So, before you tonight is that schedule, and we're here for any questions that you may have. Does the council have any questions at this time? I, I just want to make a comment, general okay. comment. Again, it's a policy comment. First of all, thank you for that, how for going through it. Um, <clears throat> I thought that um, you know we we made a policy decision before uh, limiting the development cost to uh, seventy five percent of the original of the at least initial mm -hmm. um, city cost. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, development generally is, is you don't just collect one time um, all the development or increase in in prop uh, uh, in, in value will you know will feed will pay back to the city over many many years in the form of property tax so I um, I was going to propose that we should stay with the 75 percent however um, in thinking about the city finance in the coming years and and the slowing down of um, of the um, uh, permit fees and all that, I was uh, so I'm I'm willing to go along with what the ad hoc had proposed because I think it would help our um, us recover at least initially the cost of doing business. But I have a just a little uh, suggestion for the council to consider. I mean, if you look at the appeal cost, appeal of the community, community development director decisions, now that goes from $1,000 to 1400 And planning commission decision goes from 1150 to 1500 I, I think those two I'm suggesting perhaps for the appeal cost that we keep it what it was before. Uh, because I think it is um, important that we don't, that the citizens or whoever, um, we don't want to limit people's ability to appeal a decision just because they cannot afford um, another three, four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So I just want to put it out there for the council to consider. Well, page is I'd that? like to make, I'd like to make a comment. Okay. Uh, the first page of where well, mine are like 10 of 20. Oh, uh, mm, uh, it's not numbered. 11 of 20. 11 of 20. Yeah, okay. planning service I would like to just she, um, say, I, Council I, Member I, I'm you. sorry, yes. Council Member, this is page one of attachment B. Yes. Actually shows the differential between the old and the proposed. Yeah. yeah. I'd just like to say that you were reading my mind. Uh, yeah. That was exactly what I was going to say. 
Um, Thank you. I would hate for our residents to think that we are making it more difficult for them to appeal, um, especially if it's on something that, if the appeal is gonna cost more money than the actual, then of course they're not gonna appeal it. Right. And I, I don't want to make it harder for them to appeal because we are constantly telling people, we want you, we want input from you and we want to know what's going on. And, but yet we're making it more expensive. Now, now the other thing I would like to see, which I know that the, the uh, residents can ask for this, but it isn't uh, normally done, is I think when you appeal, you should get a list of what that fee is being used for, um, whether it's staff time, whatever it is, copies, whatever, so that they know that we are not just charging them because they're not agreeing with our decision. So I would agree with you in that respect that I would like to keep at least those two mm -hmm. at 75 percent, not 100. That's a current practice. Uh, do we explain the components of the appeal process? We'll explain the components only, of the appeal process, but we, so. yeah, well, right. um, if you're asking about what is the composition of how the fee is derived, um, if, if, that's the, if, if that's the question, that's I'm asking. Right. I, I would say no, we don't go through a, a thorough analysis of, but, if, or, but, but we can, ask, we can right? provide them because we have a time and study in motion, uh, time motion study about how those fees are derived that we can provide them with that information, but I'll let Mr. Forbes answer that question. Yes, we, we generally, I mean, for, for all applications and including appeals, we let people know that in generally it's paying for the city staff time and the city resources mm -hmm. needed mm -hmm. to process it. Um, but as Mr. Cook said, we do have, for, for each of these individual fees, we have spreadsheets, um, which we have included in previous staff reports, but I didn't attach to this one just because it's voluminous. Mm -hmm. um, for each of the application types of how many hours we assume um, for each of these, how, what, what staff positions are involved, how many hours are involved, um, and then the administrative uh, overhead percentage, which was determined by the previous time and motion study. Um, so we do have all of that available, and that's all, of course, public record. So we're happy to mm -hmm. give copies to anybody who so wants it. So can we make it, um, I guess, mandatory that we at least give it to them to, uh, like I said, I just don't, I don't want any resident to feel like we're doing it on purpose. <laughs> I mean, because, Remember, you know. this does not just apply to residents, though. It applies to businesses yeah. and, the, and, and that's developers a, and as that, well. That's all. That's and great. They, they know what they're doing, or at least should know what they're doing. Well, if it's the, if, if it's not, the council's. I'm not so sure of that. If it's the council's desire, we can take the, the, the sheets that are applicable to the appeal fees and just right. attach I mean, that to the appeal application form. So from the time that know. they're considering whether they want to appeal, they can look and see what that fee is composed of. I mean, I don't of. have a problem with that. I think they should know what they're paying for up front. So, uh, uh, but, but that's a whole, I don't that's a different. Mayor Patel Fisher, are you suggesting that we give them a breakdown of the fee, then you would You know, and, and I don't not, even know. You would can allow the, the you would suggest the appeal, the, the, the cost will go up 100%? Um, I would still like to keep it at 75. Oh. If I think that that would be, my personal opinion is that would be a challenge, and I think every situation is different. I think that's getting mm -hmm. too much into the mm -hmm. weeds well, of I was just what gonna, staff does. Mm -hmm. I was just going to ask now: Would every, like, like she said, would everyone be different? I mean, we're charging them all the same fee, so why would each? breakdown be different if we're charging everybody the same fee well I think somebody might have 20 copies some might have 10 copies so I mean no 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 but but, but it wouldn't have to be be itemized to that point it could just be two hundred dollars for copying services whatever five hundred dollars for it doesn't have to be that the, yeah all each application and each appeal is unique and you know right. there's different numbers of copies and you know, things like that but the fees are all all of these fees are determined based on what the average is for all applications all appeals this is generally how many hours we spend could, so could this. we give them a general idea or do yes yeah we can we can give them a, a I mean, copy I of the sheet I, I, that I has that information on it that's not a problem have to be legally held to it just 
I think residents should know what they're paying for, especially if it has to do with an appeal. Um, so if I, if I understand maybe what Mr. Forbes is saying is a, a bulk of that cost is labor costs, right? Yes, in correct. In preparation of that correct. appeal. So I guess if it were to be broken down, you're actually breaking down into specific like staff hours? No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not saying be it being specific to each project. I'm just saying that I think that the, the person who's appealing needs to know what that $1,500 is going to. So like that equals to X staff hours? Um, yeah, but it doesn't have to be the exact dollar amount. It can be, you know, the, the, we, this is what your appeal cost is, be, is paying for. If, if I can help. Does and, that make sense? Councilmember Sternquist made a, a, a good point, which is at, at some point we're now getting into the actual administration. Um, where we started on a policy direction, which was right, right, right. Now we're I know we're totally getting off we're, subject. We, we'd like like a little bit more information from staff to appellants uh, as to you know, what's included in this cost. And and as you said, it's uh, we've done a fee study. The fee study has the averages. Mm -hmm. So it's all we're ever going to be able to have is the averages. Uh, somebody's appeal may cost much more than that. Somebody's appeal must may cost a bit less. There will be attorney time in there that may or may not be counted. Um, so I think Mr. Forbes has a good idea of what the council is looking for. I think that's something that staff can carry forward. I wouldn't even include it as part of uh, a vote tonight. I, I think it's pretty clear uh, from a policy discussion how you'd like information to be shared. And um, okay. I, I, Mr. You. Forbes, correct? Okay. Thank you very yes. much for bringing it up, Council Member. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank you. All right, but uh, I guess in terms of what council member you brought up regarding the uh, keeping it at 75% for the appeal. That's what I um, would suggest just to, 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 uh, to make the um, access to government, appealing to a government city more accessible. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's my view, but I mean, so I'm I willing to listen to the rest of the council. council member and I appreciate yeah. and respect your opinion on that, of course, but I think you could make the same argument on yeah. all of these. Yeah. Uh, you know, how mm -hmm. how accessible is it? Is it is mm -hmm. this going to have a chilling effect on any of these things? Certainly, any time we charge a fee for something, right. somebody there's somebody who's going to have to consider: is it worthwhile? Should we do business here in the city? Those are all things that are going to go into account. And I think the thinking the the thinking behind the ad hoc was that you know going over these fees. You know, bottom line is we're looking at recovery of costs. We're not making any money on this. Absolutely. Okay? And at the same time, you know, as we get back to the policy issue, how much do we want to subsidize? And given finances and things that are happening in the city, and as you mentioned earlier, you know, we, we've got some financial challenges. Is this something that we want to continue subsidizing? And that was really, the, the I think, the motivating force behind the, the recommendation. Um, I understand what you're saying. Appellate process may be a little bit different in that um, mm -hmm. they've gone through a, a procedure, they've been denied, and now we're going to provide them with an appeal process, okay? In a way, you know, certainly a fee could have a chilling effect on whether they want to, in effect, throw good money after bad, maybe, and how far they want to go with this. So I can see that. Um, I don't know that keeping it at 75%, um, given the fact that we're raising everything 100% would be equitable. Um, I would be willing, however, to perhaps get behind a proposal that would maybe set a fee at this time for appeals, since it is, a, it is an average, basically. We don't know exactly what the cost is gonna say. So right now, the proposal would be, for example, the appeal of community development director decision would go from 1,078 to 1,437. Maybe split the difference in there. Let's say $1,200 flat fee. Okay. And then for the Appeal Planning Commission, 1,159 to 1,545, maybe 1,300 to split the difference so that at least we're not subsidizing it entirely and we're, we're taking into account that we're, take, we're looking at all these fees kind of equally and, and, and at least compromising that. So, so in, in effect, Keep in mind that we still want to recover some of our costs, but again, uh, maybe raising it $100 isn't going to make that much of a chilling effect on some of these things. 
-hmm. So that that's what I would put out there. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if that's I can go along with that. I can go along with that also. Cindy, are you Absolutely. okay with that? Well, that. I actually wrote twelve hundred and thirteen fifty. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, okay, so we're fifty dollars apart. <laughs> yes. So, all right. so we're both at twelve hundred and thirteen. I, I like to I like round well, numbers. Well, it's just I guess. because it was similar to yeah. what was already there. Yeah. The, the well, difference. Yeah. So. So I don't know, I, William. I, I'm okay. I, William, it's up I, to you. I was I was actually gonna suggest lowering it, but <laughs> <it's> <laughs> how about eleven ninety nine? I was gonna say maybe just because I, I, four digits for an appeal fee just to me seems like this. But, but keep in massive. mind that these are I numbers that staffs giving us. Right this yeah. is work that they're Based doing. And, other and cities believe too. me, to a, from a legal standpoint, doing an appeal sometimes takes more work than, than the original hearing because. Now you've got to get everything together. You've got to go back through everything, take maybe even other information and add that to it. So there may be even more work that was done even before you got to the appeal process. And you know, on the flip side of that too, it could deter some people from doing frivolous appeals because they might have a hefty bank account and say, it's $1,500, I'm gonna call individually five different council members and see if I can get them on board or you know so you kind of have to look at it both ways yeah, I, absolutely. I, just, I understand yeah. I just think with our city finances um, you know looking down the road I think we need to be prudent and we're again we're not making any money but right. we can't we, we have to pay our employees so yeah. we can't hand out you know free money either so Okay. So uh, we haven't opened the public hearing yet, so oh. I'm going <laughs> to do that first. Uh, I'm going to open the public hearing. Is there anyone who would like to comment on this item at this time? All right. Come Seeing on. none, uh, I'll on, Jerry. close public comment. <laughs> sorry. sorry, Jerry. Close public comment. Uh, further council discussion, or um, if, if not, uh, any motion for? I'd like to make a this? motion okay. to. Um, I got to get my glasses on. To make the well, it's not adopt separate because no, it's the whole thing, the right? We're talking just and about that. Except for the uh, yeah. change. Why don't you do it? Since okay. I have to look at it. I up. would uh, make a motion that uh, we adopt resolution number 19 5373, approving an amended master fee and, and fine schedule for fiscal year 2018 29 with the revised fees for planning, public works, and related services, except on the recommendation on uh, items uh, on the appeal of community development director decisions um, that revised fee would be set at twelve hundred dollars and the appeal of planning commission decision that revised fee would be at thirteen hundred dollars okay second i have a motion and a second uh, can i have a roll call please Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Sternquist? Yes. Council Member Yu? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Fish? Yes. Mayor Mann? Yes. All right, so that has been um, approved. Mr. Mayor, yes. if I may, before we move on from that one, it yes. doesn't need to be part of the resolution, but just so we know coming back, um, is the direction of the council that we apply the CPI increase when we come back with the next fee schedule, which was a recommendation of the ad hoc um, and if so, did you want the CPI applied to the two appeal fees that you adjusted, or did you want to keep those a flat rate going forward? You don't have to decide tonight. I'm just looking for direction when we bring the fee schedule back. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, <laughs> it was in this. It was in the. It was part of the ad hoc's uh, recommendation. Oh. Yeah, I'd like to see the CPI if if we can do it now. Just so we so we know when we prepare the fee schedule for fiscal year 1920, we that, if we would apply the CPI or keep them fixed. All right. So the ad hoc is recommending applying the CPI to all future going forward future fee schedule. The ad hoc recommended adjusting it by the CPI every year for the next five years, and then at five years, a, a new fee comprehensive fee study would be done. But at the same time, every year, council still council has to make that decision every year. So whatever direction you give tonight is not setting anything in stone. It's just that was the the ad hoc's recommendation. It's just we would when we bring the next fee schedule back, we would bring back fees that have that CPI as the recommended fees. And if the council at that time decided you, we don't want the CPI, we're just going to leave it. You could certainly okay. do that. So uh, council member, or it, you have a question? Just is give that us a, I was just going to say, is that a motion, or are we adding that onto the? 
No, I think he's just looking for a general. We're just looking for oh, okay. direction because that was I, that was part of the ad yes. hoc's recommendation. Yes. So okay. we'd like the direction. Council member, you? Okay, so yeah. I think we have an affirmative. Okay, from all five. Thank you. Okay. All right, moving on to uh, the last item. Item ten, new business. Uh, a first reading and introduction of ordinance nineteen ten thirty three, amending chapter one section twenty one hundred of our Temple City Municipal Code regarding regular city council meetings that fall on an election day. Uh, Mayor, man, members of the council, I'll let the city clerk uh, do the presentation related to this. This is an item that was brought up uh, by council mm -hmm. member uh, and others to uh, move our elections, uh, or excuse me, move our regular meetings <laughs> uh, after a, uh, a state election. election. I'm tired and still sick, so uh, yes. go ahead, Ms. Quo. Mm -hmm. Staff was directed to bring an item to council for discussion regarding changing the regular council meetings that fall on election days to the next subsequent business day that is not a holiday to support voter participation. Per city's charter section 2.1-0, city's regular meetings are held on the first and third Tuesday of the month at 730. Any changes to the council meeting dates and time is at the discretion of the city council, but would require an amendment to the city's code. So tonight, council is requested to have a discussion and provide staff with further directions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Quo. Uh, any questions from council at no. this point? Any uh, questions? Mr. Mayor, one, one technical correction, and we can do this tonight without having to bring this back for a, a, a new first reading. Uh, I'm just I'm looking at the staff report and and the ordinance itself and I apologize for not catching this sooner the the code section is now actually 2-1-0 after the renumbering that was done a few years ago so I just want to make sure when we when we look at at the ordinance in attachment a it's not section 2100 it's 2-1-0 2-1-0 so okay. we're reading that into the record tonight uh, so that if you decide to move forward with this we won't we, we can just come back for a second reading. Okay, so part of the motion will, instead of saying section 2100, we'll say section 2-1-0. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. <coughs> All right, uh, I'd like to open up uh, the public comment for this item. Is there anyone who would like to comment on this item? All right, seeing none, I will close the public comment. Any council discussion on this item? No council discussion. Uh, may I have a motion for this? Mayor Man, I would uh, make a motion that we introduce ordinance number 19-1033 for first reading by title only, amending chapter one, section 2-1-0 of the Temple City Municipal Code, moving the regular city council meeting that fall on an election day to the next subsequent business day that is not a holiday, and that we schedule the second reading of ordinance number 19-1033 for February 5th, 2019. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Uh, may we have a roll call, please? Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Sternquist? Yes. Council Member Yu? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Fish? Yes. Mayor Mann? Yes. I just want to say I think that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Since uh, there's folks who might want to work the polls or other things, this, then you don't have to choose Forced between the two. Or we don't want to be here by ourselves. On an election Tuesday. That too, because everyone's <laughs> out there voting. All right, so next we have an update from our city manager. I'll be very brief, Mayor Man. Uh, next uh, Tuesday, January 22nd, is our um, 2019 homeless count. Um, we do have some volunteers who are willing to go out and count the homeless that are here in the city. It helps the state and the county in hopefully providing services to those who are less fortunate. Um, if you are interested in helping, uh, that starts at 8 p.m. Uh, until midnight <coughs> on the 22nd. Uh, please call City Hall if you're interested. Um, and then that's that's it actually it for uh, me tonight. Well, I've actually uh, the rain program. I oh, win. thank thank you thank you, uh, Council Member. You uh, next uh, Thursday uh, the 24th. Four. we will start to roll out the ring program online um, which will be the, uh, unlike the program that we had uh, last time where we actually came in and had to do a, a physical application verify your address and everything else actually ring <laughs> you you sign up through ring they verify your address that you're a temple city resident 
Um, if you participated in the program prior, you can still get the discounts that apply, but you cannot get the $50 subsidy for the additional, um, for the device. So that'll be rolling out. You'll do all that through Ring. It should be a lot easier so. and a lot more, uh, a lot quicker in terms of getting the subsidy and getting the product. And Brian Erzimi did a great job last time trying to process as so quickly as possible. So watch for information on city website. Uh, city website yes. and on social media. So essentially, the the city website is going to link to Ring's website. Correct. For the sign up. Yep. Okay. Got it. Right. Thank I you, sir. I have a question. Do we have an update about Lyft? Uh, I will have a, I will have a better update uh, next okay. meeting. Thank you. Uh, ex excuse, excuse me. me. It's yeah. I'm, so right now we don't have a public comment on this item. So please hold for the last. Thank you, Mayor Man. That'll, okay. that'll, that's Howdy. it for me this evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have an update from our city attorney. Uh, because of the hour, just briefly, uh, the state has updated the CEQA guidelines. Um, <laughs> the biggest change that the council will see going forward, the checklist that's used to determine whether uh, there's an impact, no impact, or no impact with mitigation has been redone. Um, and in large part it's been redone to reflect changes within the guidelines and changes to the law. Uh, there also will start to be a study of energy impacts from projects and beyond that it's mostly technical changes that you'll see in 2019. Um, we're working up a memorandum that will go to Mr. Forbes department. Uh, most of it will be it'll just look like part of the study once it gets to your level but it is something important in the planning process and, and it, to some extent the public works process as well. Um, the biggest change is one you'll see in 2020 when the traffic studies for projects will begin to use vehicle miles traveled rather than level of service at intersections. That's the big change that's coming. It's mostly technical stuff this year, but you'll begin to see some changes and so if you notice them, that's why. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next, we have uh, council reports on ad hoc or standing committee meetings. Do we have any? Nope. All right. So since there are none, um, we move on to items I separate. Think we, uh, maybe we can uh, go ahead and uh, get rid of the city fee ad hoc committee now. Since we okay. are we done with that? Mm -hmm. And we probably could get. Oh, yeah, speaking of that, we could maybe get rid of the commissioner recruitment mm -hmm. ad hoc yeah. as well. Yeah, do we still I need, guess. Do we yeah, still need yeah. that? Mm -hmm. We don't need that anymore, right? Yeah. So okay, so we'll, we'll disband the city fee ad hoc and the commissioner recruitment ad hoc for now. Okay, next we have items separate from the regular agenda. Uh, Council Member Yu. Uh, I just want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who has come tonight. And a lot, I know a lot of you have already left, but I appreciate you coming before us and uh, letting us know uh, how, um, your thoughts. We appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, Council Member Chavez? Uh, I echo the same sentiment. Uh, also, I got to give a big shout out to, uh, to Greg for that raising the arm thing. I think that, that actually worked it. out pretty I well. Love it. I'm going to have to remember that. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. I think, I think most people <laughs> agreed with it. That, that, that was a good idea. So yeah. good, good job. That's all I have. Thank right. you. Thank you. All right, Council Member Sternquist. Uh, just a couple of things. Council Mayor Pro Tem Fish and I were um, able to go with Contract Cities up to um, Sacramento. Um, we had some similar meetings and some separate meetings, but I was able to meet with a total of five um, assembly persons and um, four senators to be new. Mm -hmm. um, the the call was from contract cities was to have local control and fight for local control um, after meeting with the assembly people and, and these senators um, you know we've we've been saying this for what 10 years <laughs> if not longer that cities need to have local control um, it it'll be interesting to see if this new change up in Sacramento with quite a few new um, members mm -hmm. will make a difference so definitely we were both there to lobby for look to for cities and municipalities to keep um, local control and um, 
You know, it was interesting. Some are more engaging than others, obviously, but <laughs> they were all very gracious in hosting contract cities. So we definitely let them know about stormwater and the issues that cities are facing with that. I don't know if I had mentioned it or it had happened yet, but um, the city of Doherty and Gardena were victorious. Uh, is it um, permanent now or is it still pending? But so far it was that um, they were prevalent in that lawsuit. So this was the lawsuit over the MS4 permit, the mm -hmm. um, municipal stormwater system permit. Uh, and <clears throat> what has issued so far is a tentative ruling from the court, mm -hmm. which means it's not, it's not the court's final ruling. But unlike a normal case with a tentative ruling where there's going to be argument, this issued after trial. And the court's uh, question to the parties was, what's the proper remedy? So those briefs were filed late today. I'll be looking at them tomorrow because on behalf of Temple City, we're not actively participating, but we are monitoring. So I'll look at those briefs tomorrow, uh, and then we should hear something back from the court, I would say in 30 to 60 days, and we'll know what exactly the relief is going to be. Uh, and then obviously after that, we'll know whether the state's going to appeal this or not. Um, but the, the primary question is, does the entire MS4 permit need to be wiped out, which mm -hmm. I'm relatively certain Duarte and, and Gardena are going to say yes. Uh, and if so, then what happens? And in general, what happens is you go back to the previous permit, which was, was a lot more livable. Um, and the basis for, the primary basis for the, the court wiping this <coughs> out was the use of numeric standards rather than uh, the, the best possible, um, uh, best possible result that's practicable, and practicable meaning one of the things they have to consider is affordability, which they did not. And they mm -hmm. said several times on the record that that was not at issue in this process, that they knew that this was going to be very expensive, but that they had to move forward. So a great result for the cities and, and the county, um, and we'll just have to see what the judge actually does in terms of, of the relief. Thank you. And um, it w there was quite a bit of, of comment because Gav um, Governor Newsom was being um, installed that day and there were big signs that said, the people's inauguration. And yet you couldn't get in without a ticket. <laughs> but on every public website said, up in Sacramento, said it said free and open to the public. Mm -hmm. Everybody's invited and signs all over. But then when you got to the entrance, they're like, where's your ticket? Only certain public. Only certain public. <laughs> <laughs> but all the public was invited to a party on the lawn in front of the Capitol, and they gave away free hot dogs and water and uh, chips. So I guess that made it the people's inauguration. You know, isn't it ironic that uh, our state senators and, uh, and uh, members of the assembly came for the most part from local government and have been spouting the same things for the last 20 years about local control, yet somehow from on the flight from here to there, <laughs> mm -hmm. something transitions. And mm -hmm. I don't know if it's the water up in Sacramento or <laughs> what, but uh, let's hope, I hope, as you said, that maybe this new bunch will, will maybe right. look at things differently. We have a new governor. Uh, there are gonna be changes, of course. Uh, so we'll just have to wait and see. Hopefully it'll be for the good. But, uh, and, and I think that's the key, and in all my conversations, that I had with the assembly members and the Senate members was, don't forget your roots. You know, don't mm -hmm. forget where you came from. If you were, you're from local government and you know the issues, you know the issues with housing, with homelessness, and um, they're like, oh, we're we're not going to forget. We have you all in mind. So, I think that message has to, you know, it's not once a year from contract cities. It's Continually Continu with yes. cog cities and with skag cities, and you know, reminding these senators and reaching out to them, writing letters and letters because they depend on us. They're they're writing bills all the time, and they they need support. So um, they can't do it without us, and we have to remind them of that. Uh, and you I guys just want to thank you guys for your participation because contract cities is important. We don't, you know, that's one of the major groups that we do belong to and participate and they they do have a voice in mm -hmm. in sacramento and 
and mm -hmm. I'm thankful that you guys are taking a hands-on approach to that. Uh, you know, I know I don't I don't think I've ever gone to Sacramento trip, and we usually don't go to that, but. I think well, they I do a legislative tour That's every yeah. year, yeah. and you're all invited. I went we are all invited. Twice a year, right? It's yeah. always a different um, time. Yeah. You know, different. It's a, oh, yeah. I think it's to January, beginning of January. January. Always. Oh, so it's always a little difficult getting it, back in. They, may, they are thinking about changing it next year. Yeah, that would be good. But Did, there was any conversation regarding public safety? Yes. That um, the laws have been so liberal, the, the three, pro criminals, yeah. I might, I might <laughs> say. The three big... Uh, Actually, Contract Cities, I believe, had about eight different subjects, but we concentrated on housing and homelessness, public safety, and local control. Okay. Right. And, and you have to remember, they're <laughs> literally sometimes 20 minutes. They're 20 minute slots. Right. Well, you can't go in and start talking about homelessness or other issues and you know you could spend all day talking about those issues so it's very difficult to have any really lengthy conversation and i have to tell you um a couple of the new senate members were very gracious with their time and yes. actually spent 45 minutes which is huge um a time slot but there were others um ling ling with um where Be was nice. she Be from nice. walnut and uh, she, she was ready to go at 18 minutes, you know, like walking us to the door. Well, she's a returning. She's not newly elected. She's returning. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a difference. The newer ones seem to be a little bit more willing to... Enthusiastic. Yeah, enthusiastic about local government. So let's mm -hmm. hope that mm -hmm. well, they the continue. Well, if you showed up, they should give you 40 minutes. There right? you go. So, <laughs> they, double time. They, they did, but we, no, we did... No, they 10 minutes each. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's yeah. whomever talks the loudest is really kind of. Well, you shouldn't have a problem. Thing. No. And then the last thing I just <laughs> thank you, Tom. Thank you. That was a compliment. <laughs> and then the last thing is, um, just with the rains, um, <coughs> the cooler weather has produced a much smaller mosquito population Yay. in the San Gabriel Valley. So that's a really good thing. But then we have to remember that as soon as these rains come, we have a lot of water. stuff water. to dump pails, pans, um, little planter um, cups that hold the, the plant in place. So just remember after we go through these storms to take the time to dump and drain. And hopefully we'll continue to have good results with, with that. So other than that, um, thank you to everyone who came out. Um, you know, sometimes it's very difficult to um, be patient <laughs> and um, we, always want things done you know now so we can all go home and sleep better at night but there is always a process and i am an impatient person but um there are times when i have to take a back seat and leave the things that are best for someone like greg our city attorney right. to advise us and follow those um guidelines that he puts in place but um i couldn't be more thrilled I don't want to say thrilled. I'm not thrilled to sue anybody, but I couldn't be more thrilled with the support from the residents who came out and know that this is has not been done properly. And that's what I feel that this lawsuit will provide. Um, and anyway, just thanks again for the continued support. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Fish. Mm, well, I echo. Councilmember Sternquist, um, of course, I always welcome everyone to come to the meetings. I always say, please come, tell us your concerns. Um, we're only five people, um, and this was a big one. So again, also thank you for your patience. We do have to listen to our attorneys, do it right the first time. We don't want any mistakes. Um, so hopefully, with your help and support, we can follow through on this. I also would like to thank, he has gone already, but our captain, I think it was wonderful. He did send us each a report, but I think it was very nice for him to take the time to come and let the residents know, you know, this is on the web, so it is gonna be reaching a lot of people. And just know that our sheriff's department, they work very, very hard, and we are very, very lucky. And sometimes they don't get very good press. Um, so I personally just like to thank them and their team. They work very hard, especially our 
city. I have to. I have a, a little special place with de for deputies, but I just want to thank them. And then the last thing is, um, I would like to also thank the residents for allowing me to represent you in Sacramento, and for paying for my trip, and for you know knowing that when any of us go to Sacramento or Washington, D.C., that we are representing the residents of Temple City. And one of the big things with local control, especially at the state and federal level, is they think all the cities are the same, and we're not. Temple City is much, much different. And we don't want to be governed like Sacramento or Hemet or some other city, which are great cities, but they're not Temple City. So we go there. Um, these meetings we have are private meetings in their offices. They, we limit to about between four to six people that see them. It's um, a little bit harder for them to look us in the eye and tell us different things than it is over an email or a telephone call. And that's what we want. We want to ask them the tough questions. Uh, we do go in very prepared. We are usually only allowed 20 minutes. Like she said, sometimes we get a little bit more. Sometimes we, the staff is waiting at the door to escort us out after 19 and a half minutes. So we have to get all of our stuff in there. Uh, the other thing is we want them to know what we look like. We want them to have our business cards. We want to have their business cards. We want to be able to get a hold of them and say, hey, what's going on? What are you doing? What is, what's going on with this bill? What does this mean? Um, I have to say some of them are kind of ridiculous, but you know, that's, that's their job. So we do want to make sure that we have personal relationships with these people, and that's another reason why we go. Uh, one thing that they did mention to us, besides all the things we mentioned to them, was redevelopment. Um, redevelopment has always been a big issue with our council. Uh, they are talking about it. It will probably not be named redevelopment because that's gotten a bad rap, just that name but they do realize that we do need help, and the state does have money, so I'm hoping that in the future there will be some funds available for us. Uh, we're gonna be watching that. All of the contract cities have said that they had very good results with the redevelopment program, so um, that's good news. It's not like it's something where Governor Brown did not even want to discuss it this is at least it's coming down the line. They're talking about it. They're talking about it in discussions. So that's a good thing. Um, it was the beginning of the session. Everybody's very enthusiastic. Lots of, lots, lots, I don't know if any of you have gone and seen all the bills that have, the new bills that have passed in California. There's a lot of them. I suggest you go on the web and look them up. Um, some of them are very good. Some of them are not so good. Uh, and Look at the it. traffic ticket ones. <laughs> the traffic so tickets just, have increased yes. so much. Re that read them because be careful. Th yeah, they're they're like I said, some of them have really. Yeah, I I, I don't know how they decide that, but um, there's been a lot of changes, and we'll see what the governor does. Um, unfortunately, we weren't allowed in the inauguration, but we got to stand outside and watch. So, thank you. <laughs> okay. I don't know if this is ha what it has to do with anything, but <laughs> there was a huge turkey the day of the inauguration, a live turkey, like right in the entrance to the Capitol where you go to the inauguration. So I don't know if that's just indigenous to that area, but it was so awkward to have this big, huge turkey <laughs> just wobbling around there. But anyway. Turkey doesn't need a ticket. No, Turkey didn't need a ticket. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Fish. And so I, I too want to thank everyone, especially, I know some of you have toughed it out to this late hour. <laughs> yeah. You've been here since uh, before closed session. And, um, <laughs> I, and I think that might have been one of our first or very few closed sessions where we've had people comment on the closed session mm -hmm. item. Uh, so again, the, that's another series of firsts. Uh, I, I think it's been an interesting learning process for a lot of us. I know a lot of residents who have been very aware of and very concerned about this issue. This may be sort of your first foray into 
dealing with local government, local government issues. And so I, I understand how difficult that could be, especially when you're trying to decipher so many different angles to a very, very complicated situation. And so I appreciate everyone's patience. I appreciate the folks who have reached out, the folks who have uh, done their own research and shared their thoughts. And, and, uh, and a lot of times, sometimes just being physically present at some, some place, it's, it goes a long way just to show support. I mean, like when Mr. Murphy said, just raise your hand if you agree with something, then you know, that's, that's a very visual thing, visual image that everyone can, can see. Sometimes that visual image is more powerful than any words you can actually say. Uh, so, so thank you for, for your patience as well as uh, your, your concern and, and um, opinions on, on those issues. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how, how that develops moving forward. Uh, and just one final thing, I just realized that our next council meeting is gonna be after our Lunar New Year Festival, which is gonna be on February. I was gonna talk about it at the next meeting that I realized, well, oh, that's gonna did, be right after that. Think about it. uh, it's gonna be on February 2nd, which is a Saturday, uh, from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. It will be right out here in Temple City Park. Uh, I see Miss Lucy Lou waving her hands up. One, one, to four. Oh, one through four, I'm sorry, thank you, thank you, one through four. Thanks for the correction. Uh, one through four right outside here in Temple City Park. Um, if you've been to our last couple ones, you kind of get a <coughs> similar sense of taste of, um, it's, it's a different scale than, than other things like the Autumn Moon Festival that we did with World Journal. This one's a lot more uh, homey, more close to home. It's, it's done by, our, uh, by city staff as well as um, in partnership with the Temple City Chinese American Association. So, so we thank staff for putting that together, and as well as numerous volunteers who um, have been working on making that event work for several years now. Uh, and having said that, um, we'll move on to the final segment of public comments. It's kind of late, but uh, if there's anyone who'd like to, Mr. Jerry. <laughs> Good evening again, Mayor Mann and Council Members. Uh, Jerry Jambasian, 9136 Lost Tunis Drive. And, uh, oh, let me get it. Oh, I forgot to mention that. I, I want to, I know the hour is late, but I want to invite anybody that's listening to the 75th annual coronation of the Royal Court. Yes, sir. This Saturday, Saturday at Live Oak Park, 7 o'clock, so everybody's invited. It's free. It's fun. Uh, entertainment by the Brighter Side Singers, so that's worth the price of admission of zero. So uh, it's, a, it's a great thing. Uh, I'd also like to give kudos to staff and council for this excellent piece that I got in the mail yesterday. <laughs> It is it's amazing. So great. Uh, the size and the content. I mean, it has everything you could want in here, what I want to call for the fun department. Mm -hmm. And that's parks and recreation and, and all the classes that they offer and, and the uh, Lunar New Year celebration, the dim sum and tea, which is kind of fantastic in the shelter area of the uh, Live Oak Park. And of course, the Camellia Festival and Temple City's Got Talent and the Easter Egg Hunt, and it just goes on and on. Spring Camp, it is colorful, it is amazing. The graphics are first class. I mean, we're a small city, but we do stuff good. Yes, we do. And it's amazing to me. So, whoever was responsible for this, I didn't even know it was coming out. I was expecting a connect sometime, but didn't expect this. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I will leave you with this. OK? <laughs> thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Is there anyone else that would like to? OK, I see Lucy in the back. Thank you, Mayor, for bringing it up. Uh, but I'm going to tack on for the Lunar New Year event on February 2nd between 1 and 4. There's free food sampling, free entertainment, um, 
raffles. So it's a great event for the entire family. Uh, everybody is welcome. And uh, try your luck. We have um, some really good prizes. Uh, we always have red envelope cash prizes. That always draws people. But we have additional other prizes. So try your luck. I, I don't have good luck, but you should try yours. <laughs> Mike let one or iPad last year. Oh, oh wow. Oh. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yes. So, so he's definitely going this year. Yeah. <laughs> if I may. Okay. Bummer. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Lucy. Is there anyone else who would like to speak at this time? All right. Uh, having said that, uh, as Mr. Steve Terry and Mayor Pro Tem Fish mentioned earlier, um, I'd like to adjourn tonight's meeting in memory of Paul Smithers, the husband of Bridget Smithers who was the secretary of the Hawkesbury Sister City Association. We're adjourned. <laughs>